Welcome back to World Religions, a video series to accompany a semester-long survey of World Religions class, specifically to accompany the textbook A Short Introduction to World Religions, edited by Christopher Partridge. Part 4, Buddhism. We will cover Buddhism in four chapters, 18, Historical Overview, 19, Sacred Writings or Scriptures, 20, Main Beliefs, and 21, Buddhism in the Modern World. Chapter 18, Historical Overview. Buddhism is a word that refers to the religion based on the Dharma, the teaching, the law of the Buddha. The Buddha is a title that means awakened one or enlightened one. You could also translate it as knowledgeable one. It's currently fashionable to accept the etymology or word history of the word Buddha as coming from a word that means awake or awakened, but it's also been argued, uh, such as by Bhikkhu Bodhi, a Theravada scholar monk, that the word actually comes from uh, a word that means to know. And so the enlightened one or the knowledgeable one is also a good translation for Buddha. Dharma in Buddhism means the way things are or the Buddha's teaching about the way things are. So it has a different meaning from other Indian religions, whereas in Hinduism, for example, Dharma does refer to the way things are and the moral law, but more connected with the creation of Brahman, the supreme being, and the teachings of the Veda. Whereas in Buddhism, Dharma means the teaching of the Buddha about the way things are. Buddhism uh, believes in many Buddhas, not just the historical founder of the religion, who was named Siddhartha Gautama. So according to most Buddhists, Siddhartha Gautama is the current Buddha or the last Buddha, the Buddha of this age. But there have been many Buddhas before, and there will be many Buddhas in the future as well. Uh, sometimes to distinguish Siddhartha Gautama from other Buddhas, he may be called Shakyamuni or Shakyamuni Buddha. Shakyamuni is Sanskrit for the sage Muni, which means a wise person, of the Shakyas, which is the ancient tribe that Siddhartha belonged to. The picture on the slide is of a Dharma wheel, which symbolizes the Buddha's Dharma or teaching. Specifically, the eight spokes in this version of the wheel represent the eight parts of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is the Buddha's teaching of how to attain enlightenment. There are other versions of the Dharma wheel that have 12 or more spokes though as well. So a bit about Siddhartha Gautama, the founder of Buddhism. His surname Gautama was the name of his clan. Uh, his given name Siddhartha is Sanskrit for power, Siddha, and success, Artha. It was a common name of the nobility of ancient India, and he was born into the Kshatriya or noble class. Um, after his enlightenment, he became known as the Buddha. Now, it must be said, um, there's a lot of historical context here we could go into. The general consensus of scholars is that the Shakyas didn't have the full Aryan or Vedic culture and uh, Varna or caste system that other areas further to the south in India did. The uh, Shakyas lived in the foothills of the Himalayas, so at the far northern edge of ancient India. And they did have uh, some aspects of the um, major Indian Aryan and Vedic culture with Brahmins, the priests, the Veda, etc. But apparently uh, the caste system was not quite as rigid or developed there. Nevertheless, the consensus is that yes, the uh, Buddha Siddhartha was born into the noble class. Although uh, he also probably did not live this lavish lifestyle of a king or prince, the way he was depicted in some later legendary accounts. So the traditional dates of the Buddha's life often given by Buddhists themselves are 563 to 483 BC. And my understanding is that this dating is relatively modern. I don't know if it was first developed in the 18 or 1900s, but sometime in the last century or two. 
Uh, scholars debate exactly when the Buddha was alive. Most do agree he was a historical figure, not purely legendary. And the consensus is that he probably lived in the 400s or the 5th century BC. Uh, he lived for around 80 years and he died around 400 BC. Um, so the more historical accounts we have of the Buddha are largely from the Pali Canon, which is the oldest complete collection of Buddhist scriptures. He was born into the Shakya tribe, into a high uh, class, um, so his father would have been some kind of noble. It appears that the Shakyans probably did not have a single king who ruled over all of them, but rather they had um, a system of government that's sometimes called tribal republic by modern scholars so they had elders from the elite families who would gather uh, to decide the affairs of the kingdom or of the state so it wasn't just one person who had all the power um, but the way he describes his own youth in the Pali canon he describes himself as being intoxicated uh, with youth with health and with life but at some point when he was a young man, he meditated or contemplated the fact that eventually he too would get old, he would get sick, and he would die. And this caused him to no longer be intoxicated with youth, with health, and with life, but rather to seek some transcendent, you might say, or deeper reality that um, would not fade like his body and mind. And what he ultimately discovered that answered this quest was Nirvana, but that would come later in his story. Nirvana is the state of the deathless, the state of enlightenment that is realized or experienced by a Buddha and other enlightened beings in Buddhism. So the way he describes it in the Pali Canon is that he decided to cut his hair to give up all of his wealth and worldly attachments to leave home. He describes his parents watching him as he made this vow and they were crying because they didn't want him to leave. Um, they probably wanted him to have a family, get married, uh, become a leader in the society or what have you. But he left home and he studied under two different gurus or teachers, Alara Kalama, who's generally regarded as having been a member of the Sankhya school of Hindu thought, or perhaps he was just something like that in terms of believing a theory of the soul and teaching meditation techniques to understand the true nature of the soul or self. And eventually he left Alarma after learning all the doctrines and all the meditation techniques and went to a different teacher, uh, Uddhaka Ramaputta, who um, we don't know that much about these teachers, but it's also possible that Uddhaka Ramaputta was influenced by um, Vedic religion, i.e. Hinduism. His surname means son of Rama. And I don't know, this it was probably before the time that Rama was worshipped as an avatar or incarnation of the Hindu god Vishnu. So it may not indicate a connection to Hinduism specifically, but certainly Uddhaka Ramaputta would have been teaching um, theories of meditation, probably had some teachings of karma and the self or soul, etc. This was in northern India at the time of many different sects of shramanas or strivers, people who were living an ascetic lifestyle. They were renouncing the world for the sake of knowledge or salvation or enlightenment. So the Buddha does say that he mastered the meditation techniques of these two teachers and was able to attain very refined states of consciousness, but he did not attain complete enlightenment. These were conditioned or temporary states of meditation that he would eventually slip out of. So he hadn't ultimately solved the problem of suffering or the problem of impermanence of uh, everything that we experience. So he left Uddhaka Ramaputta, decided to practice extreme asceticism or renunciation on his own um, in what you might call the wilderness. Uh, realistically, he probably spent time in forests and things like that, but also would go on occasion to villages in order to get alms. Um, but he would also practice fasting for very long periods. He met up with some other ascetics who were living a similar lifestyle, and they'd be kind of they became kind of like companions in the spiritual quest and 
urged each other on to greater exertion in their asceticism. The Buddha fasted for so long that he became uh, very haggard or skeletal looking. And you can find some depictions of this in Buddhist art. He describes his appearance in vivid detail in the Pali Canon. Uh, so you could see, for example, all of his vertebrae on his back. They looked like pearls on a string. Um, so unfortunately, this also did not lead to enlightenment. So he had the thought, I've pushed myself to the brink of my body's capacity. He was at the threshold of death, essentially. For example, he continued his fast. He was so weak, he could barely stand up. He could barely answer the call of nature without passing out. So he thought this is not actually productive. If anything, the physical weakness was interfering with his ability to practice meditation or concentration. So he broke his fast. He got um, some rice gruel from a pious laywoman and he decided, uh, he resolved that he would sit under a fig tree for cover and he would practice meditation until he attained enlightenment or died trying. So he continued meditating under that tree and in fairly short succession because of this new resolve and this new understanding, he was able to see into the nature of suffering, its cause, its end, and the path or method to bring about its end. And those are the four noble truths or the heart of his dharma. He attained enlightenment, uh, bodhi, and he experienced the reality of nirvana, the deathless or the unconditioned. Um, in Buddhism, they don't believe in Brahman, a god or a supreme being, but they do believe in this eternal, unconditioned, deathless reality called nirvana, which is what is discovered by Buddhas and then taught to others. So after he was enjoying the bliss of enlightenment and nirvana, he questioned whether he should try to teach this to anyone else because the path is subtle. Many people would not understand it, but a god appeared to him, um, a type of Brahma, who uh, in Buddhism, they do believe in heavenly beings, uh, devas, gods, and others. Um, they have a whole classification system of them. But most of these beings are not enlightened. So actually, in terms of their knowledge and in terms of their worthiness to worship, the gods are usually ranked below Buddhas in Buddhism. And in fact, this god, uh, this Brahma, came to the Buddha and asked the Buddha to teach him the Dharma and also asked that he teach the Dharma to other beings for their benefit. And his reasoning was, as long as some beings will benefit to some degree, it would be worth it. The Buddha agreed, so he began his ministry. Um, after talking to the Brahma, his first human uh, students were the five ascetics whom he had left behind. And when he reappeared, they regarded him as a quitter, someone who had broken his fast. They knew about that as someone who had fallen into a luxurious lifestyle by their standards or a life of passion. But they decided to hear him out. They could tell by his countenance that he was glowing, something had changed. So he taught the first sermon or sutra, which literally means thread or like a discourse, uh, an essay on a common topic, which in Buddhism is called the Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta or the wheel Chaka of uh, turning pavatana of the dharma turning of the dharma wheel the wheel in buddhism symbolizes the many spokes or facets of the dharma the buddhist teaching and this sutra is the one that got that wheel in motion or pavatana so this is the first uh, sutra of the buddha it talks mainly about the four noble truths which we will get back to in a moment the ascetics realized he had indeed found nirvana they became his followers they were the first Buddhist monks. And then for the next several decades, around 40 years, he continued to walk around Northern India along the Ganges River Valley. And he gained many, many other monks, nuns, and male and female lay followers, including some kings, Brahmins, and other high status people. Eventually, after around 40 years, his physical body died and he entered a state known as Parinirvana which in Buddhism means perfect or complete nirvana. So the Buddhists have this belief that you can attain nirvana or enlightenment when you're still alive, but you still have your body in samsara or the world of reincarnation, rebirth of temporary conditioned existence. So what happens is once your last karma reaches its fruit, 
then you can let go of your last body. And it's an even more perfect, fully realized state of separation from samsara, which is basically the realm of impermanence and suffering. So the parinirvana of the Buddha is regarded as a good thing. And the Buddha says, even before he died, that the state of being of someone who has attained parinirvana, uh, he calls them tathagatas, one who've gone over there to the other side. Um, you cannot define their state of being. They neither exist nor not exist, nor both, nor neither. It's called the fourfold negation. But nevertheless, Buddhists, they don't believe that the consciousness or being of an awakened one is extinguished or annihilated upon attaining parinirvana. Rather, it just enters this more exalted, you might say, state of being that cannot be defined using our ordinary limited concepts. So uh, those were some of the main events of the Buddha's life as they're kind of indicated in the Pali Canon. There's a lot more in there as well. He had a conflict with one of his cousins, Devadatta, who kind of betrayed him and tried to split his uh, sect, split the Sangha. There were kings that would occasionally go to him for help or conspire against him. There's a lot of amazing stories. Um, however, there were also later accounts of the Buddha's life. And one of the reasons for this is even though the Pali Canon, uh, which are the ancient Buddhist scriptures, do contain a lot of historical info or you know, presumably historical info stories from the Buddha's life, they're not arranged in chronological order. Rather, the Buddha mentions things that he did or that happened to him as they come up when he's teaching a person on some topic or theme. So there were these later uh, biographies where all of the events of the Buddha's life were put into chronological order. But when these were compiled, a lot of other traditions had grown up. And so a lot of the details of the later biographies are legendary. Like, for example, Siddhartha was born the very wealthy prince of a super powerful king. Um, and he lived in complete luxury and was completely sheltered from ever seeing an old person or a sick person or a dead person by his father. These are details that most Buddhists actually do believe in, but they're probably not historically accurate. Uh, another example of this is the later biographies describe the Buddha as sneaking away from the royal palace to become an ascetic under cover of darkness, where when everyone, including his wife and infant child, were asleep. The uh, Pali Canon also doesn't mention that he ever married or had a son. Um, there are people mentioned in the Pali Canon that are later identified as his wife and son, but they're not described as that in the original scripture. So this is just to show you that a lot of the stories told about the Buddha developed later, and many of them are probably legendary. So what were some of the main teachings of the Buddha? Well, we'll go through a brief synopsis right now to give you a general idea, and then we'll come back to these later and unpack them a bit more. So uh, one of the main teachings is dukkha or suffering. Dukkha is a word in the Pali language. This is the language of the oldest complete Buddhist scriptures. It was a later form of Sanskrit that more closely matched the way people spoke when the Buddha was alive. Dukkha can mean suffering or pain. It's also sometimes translated as dis-ease, as in a lack of ease. And it can be gross or extreme, you know, like extreme pain, or it can be very subtle. So anything that has any aspect of lack of perfect ease or lack of perfect satisfactoriness would be classified as dukkha in Buddhism. And the idea of the Buddha's teaching is not that everything we experience is suffering. Um, it might be true to some degree. So perhaps even the best, the most pleasurable experience in our ordinary way of experiencing the world, samsara, is going to have some element, some tiny sliver at least of suffering in it. But they do recognize that there's lots of pleasures in samsara as well. There can also be good or wholesome states of being. But the problem is um, there is inevitable suffering as long as people are or other conscious beings are in samsara. 
there's going to be some degree of disease and there's going to be the prospect of greater pain, greater suffering, loss, separation of things you love, death, all this sort of stuff is part and parcel of samsara. So that's the kind of problem or the disease, the spiritual disease that Buddhism is supposed to heal or solve. Um, the Buddha also taught that the nature of suffering is clinging to what he called the five aggregates. The five aggregates or skandhas are a way of classifying our experience of physical and mental phenomena. So according to the Buddha, what is suffering is not really the aggregates or aspects of our experience themselves, but rather our psychological response, the clinging to them, that is the suffering. Um, the Buddha also says that the cause of this clinging and suffering is craving, trishna or tanha, which literally means thirst. Uh, and the thirst, the desire, the craving can be for states of being, states of non-being, or just uh, for various sensations. And so the idea is that the, we are causing our own suffering through these psychological processes that we're ignorant of. And the suffering is just going to continue as long as we remain ignorant of the cause of the suffering and how to abandon it. But the Buddha also teaches there is an end or cessation of suffering, but it can only be brought about by uh, getting rid of craving, which will then get rid of the clinging, which is the suffering itself. And the only way you can really get rid of the craving in the mind is by training your mind, train your action, and you'll be able to see the way things really are, including through practicing meditation and following moral vows and things like that. By the way, uh, this picture in the slide is of the so-called four sites of the Buddha or the four passing sites, where according to the legendary biography of the Buddha, when he was still being sheltered in the royal palace and his father, the king, didn't want him to escape that lifestyle, he did manage to go with his charioteer on the chariot outside the palace where the gods basically um, made it possible for him to see a sick man, an old man, and a dead man, as well as the fourth sight, which was a renunciate, someone who had renounced the world for the sake of nirvana. And according to the legendary account, this is what inspired the Buddha to leave home and become an ascetic. The Buddha also taught a doctrine of impermanence, which is that all conditioned existences, which is everything we experience ordinarily, whether you classify it as mental phenomena like thoughts or feelings or physical phenomena like physical objects that we may perceive, all of these things are not eternal. They are impermanent. And it's connected to the fact that they are conditioned or caused or dependent. The idea is these things come about only when their cause is present. And when their cause goes away, then they too will also go away. This is called this, that conditionality in Buddhism. And the reason why craving causes suffering and why clinging is suffering is because we crave and cling to these impermanent things. So it's kind of like we're setting ourselves up for loss, for separation, and thus for suffering. The Buddha also had a teaching called not self, anatta in Pali. And this has different interpretations by different Buddhists. In fact, some of these sects or schools of Buddhism differentiate themselves based on how they interpret not self. Um, one way of understanding it, this is I'm getting from the Theravada scholar monk, uh, Tanisaro Bhikkhu who uh, lives and works in a monastery in San Diego, uh, California, although he was trained in a traditional form of uh, Buddhism uh, in Thailand. But um, his interpretation of this is that the not-self is a strategy for avoiding suffering. Other Buddhists may interpret it as a metaphysical theory about the nature of the person or of the alleged self. But the basic idea is that what we tend to think of as our self, what we say is me or mine or I, these are impermanent, causally conditioned things that are not worthy of being identified with. 
and the very process of identification, which is sometimes translated as I making, me making, or mine making. So it's a psychological process of identity construction. This is part of craving and clinging. There's craving and clinging bound up in it. So we have to renounce that psychological process in order to attain enlightenment and the bliss of freedom from suffering. Um, so this is a very important part of uh, Buddhist doctrine. It, it might be a bit misleading to think of it as the no self or no soul theory, which would imply that conscious beings like humans or animals don't exist. When the Buddha specifically critiques what he calls annihilationism or nihilism, that would be the more extreme denial of the reality of a person or of a conscious being. But he also rejects what he calls eternalism, which is the converse view or the opposite view rather, that there is an unconditioned and permanent self or person. So he has this kind of middle way view between them um, that the conscious beings or sentient beings as it's often translated exist in a certain way, but they're conditioned by their own karma, by their own thought, intention, and action. But regardless, uh, not self, you could also think of it as the no ego view. So the idea is you don't want to have pride, you don't want to have mental conceit, and you don't want to cling to impermanent things through this process of I making, me making, and mind making. So not self, uh, because it involves thought, intention, it's connected to karma which literally means action. Um, the Buddha interprets karma as intention. So where the real action is, so to speak, is in the intentions within a person's mind, sometimes very deep in there. Maybe they're not always conscious or fully conscious of them. And Buddhists, this is one of the main areas that they overlap with Hindus and Jains. They agree that karma causally conditions or influences the phenomena, the reality that beings experience, both in this life and in the next. So they believe in rebirth. Um, beings will be reborn into a new body. Could be a different human body, maybe a different sex, maybe a different varna or caste, maybe animal body, maybe the body of a divine being in the heavens or a hell being or being suffering in the hells. Um, so there's many possible states of being dependent on your past karma. But even if you're reborn as a god in one of the heavenly realms, that is not regarded as the ideal state of being. You're still actually trapped in samsara. And even though the gods usually have a lot of bliss or pleasure, and their states of mind tend to be more refined than that of humans, animals, ghosts, or hell beings, nevertheless... Um, they will have an impermanent state of existence in heaven. It will eventually come to an end when the good fruit of their past good karma runs out. And so they eventually will be reborn. And it's even possible for a god, after living for millions or however many years, they're very long-lived, even though they're not truly eternal, they could be reborn as a human with a lot of suffering or even as a hell being or a hungry ghost. So the goal is not to just work your way up to the higher levels of being in the heavens, but rather to transcend the whole system of rebirth altogether. And then you would have realization of nirvana. So nirvana literally means not near uh, vana or binding. So you're unbinding. There's different interpretations of this. Tanasaro Bhikkhu that uh, modern uh, Thai uh, Theravadan scholar monk who I mentioned, he interprets this using the Buddha's own metaphor of a fire unbinding from its fuel. Um, it connects to the way fire was interpreted in ancient India as something that would cling to its fuel when it was burning. And so fire can be used as a metaphor in Buddhism for craving, clinging, and suffering. And the idea is it's actually a better state for that fire to be extinguished or to go out. Now, do keep in mind that the extinction 
uh, that is related to nirvana is not an annihilation of the self or of consciousness altogether. The Buddha explicitly denies that. But what is being annihilated is the fuel of suffering, which is craving. And so this is actually regarded as a state of blissful release. It's cool like the fuel when the fire stops. So it's actually a good thing. And the idea is you can attain nirvana while you're still alive. It can also be attained after the death of a human body, but usually it would be attained while the person lives, but they will no longer have rebirth, no longer have a future incarnation. After the death of their last body, then their awareness, such as it is, will be in this undefined state but still realizing nirvana somehow, somewhere outside of samsara or conditioned reality. And the path to nirvana, that's the Noble Eightfold Path, um, you have to develop moral conduct, meditation, and wisdom. And once you develop those sufficiently, then you can see into the nature of your mind and reality, undo the craving, clinging, and suffering. The Buddha founded a Sangha, or order of monks and nuns. Sangha literally means assembly or gathering, and this is his way of referring to the clergy who follow him. They're people who practice an ascetic lifestyle. So even though the Buddha rejected what the Buddhists call extreme or excessive asceticism, um, they still do live very simply. They, the clergy, the monks and nuns, renounce the world for the sake of attaining nirvana. That's the ultimate goal. Um, and in order to do so, most Buddhists believe you can't have a job or wealth, you can't have a family, um, or at least you have to renounce them. You basically gain the Sangha as a spiritual family. Um, and this is basically a way of getting yourself more detached, less clinging, less craving of various things in samsara and it's only with the lifestyle of a monk or nun again according to most buddhists not all of them that you can attain nirvana so the monks and nuns live on alms or offerings of food and other requisites from lay people they are not supposed to handle or retain wealth and they devote their whole lives to following the noble eightfold path to enlightenment and also to teaching the dharma to others so the Buddha taught a Vinaya or code of conduct while he was still alive. And many of the rules in the code of conduct were ex, um, inspired by particular problems that would come up, usually when one of the monks had misbehaved. And so the Buddha would have to introduce a new rule to deal with the situation. Um, the Buddha did not appoint a single person as his successor to lead the Sangha when he died. And so instead, he um, advocated a system where the elders would gather together to try to resolve their disputes collectively. Um, ultimately, this led to the schism or splitting of the Buddhist clergy into multiple sects, but that was a couple centuries after the death of the Buddha. Uh, so according to uh, the textbook, it describes how the sects of Buddhism were not so much mm, drawn apart from each other due to disputes in doctrine. In truth, there was some of that, but it's also true that a lot of times a single sect of Buddhism is defined by an ordination lineage. So in other words, this is a lineage, a sequence of monks where one is the spiritual predecessor, you might say, of the other that initiates them, ordains them as a monk. So it's akin to the Christian notion of the apostolic succession of how Jesus gave spiritual authority to the apostles. They gave it to the ancient presbyters uh, and deacons of the early church, and then that was transmitted on to later generations of bishops and priests. So the Buddhist idea is of an ordination lineage that goes back to the Buddha. But when you have a split in the Sangha, that means that some monks, their lineage of ordination has broken off from that of others. And that would often be over disagreements in practice, over the Vinaya, the code of conduct. 
apart from that, um, they're depending on the era and the country and the specific sect, but there is often considerable leeway given to doctrinal interpretations. You can, in some cases, have different opinions about the Buddha's Dharma or how to interpret it, but not be in formal schism with your sect. So that's what the textbook is trying to talk about when it introduces some of these themes. Now, the schism or split of the Sangha into different sects only emerged after the Second Council. The First Council was sometime shortly after the death of the Buddha, probably a few years after his death, so around 395 BC, in the modern uh, town of Rajgir, ancient Rajagaha. According to the tradition of the Buddhists, all of the um, monks gathered together to recite the Pali Canon, to recite the sutras, which are the sermons or discourses, and the Vinaya or code of conduct that had been taught by the Buddha. Um, and so this is basically a way for them to reaffirm to each other that yes, we are agreeing, we are chanting together these teachings of the Buddha, and then we will transmit this to our students and followers. Around 100 years after the death or parinirvana of the Buddha, there was a second council at Vaishali. And this was arising over a dispute in the Vinaya, the monastic code. There were several um, items in dispute, such as whether monks were allowed to accept donations of money. Um, and that was actually against the teaching of the original Buddha. The monks at the second council could not come to a complete agreement, though. And the details of this are a little bit murky um, to scholars. Different uh, sects of Buddhists have different explanations of what exactly happened, and a lot of it is just lost to time. But there was a split between two main factions, the Staviravadins and the Mahasangikas, each of which had their own vinaya or code of conduct. 35 years after the Second Council, there was another dispute, too, that was started by a fellow named Mahadeva. He was a Buddhist, but he was arguing that the enlightenment of an arhant, which means a worthy one or pure one, someone who attains nirvana after following the teaching of a Buddha, their enlightenment is inferior to that of a true full-fledged Buddha. Um, in Buddhism, arhants and Buddhas are both considered enlightened beings who have attained nirvana, but the Buddhas are often given a more exalted status because they are the teachers of the Dharma to a whole universe. In order to get the title of Buddha, you have to reintroduce the Dharma to your universe after it's been lost or forgotten or fallen into decline. So Mahadeva was arguing that the Arhants, they're actually inferior to the Buddhas. And this led to um, the real split between Staviravadins and Mahasangikas. And eventually there were eight different sects of Buddhism in ancient India. And they were splitting both uh, along doctrinal lines, such as the, the nature of the person or self the nature of the enlightenment of an arhant or Buddha, as well as over disagreements in the Vinaya or code of conduct. Now, only one of these ancient schools or sects of Buddhism survives. That's Theravada, which means the teaching of the elders. It's an ordination lineage or a collection of ordination lineages that are prominent in South and Southeast Asia. So like the modern nations of Sri Lanka and Thailand, for example, are Theravada Buddhists. Um, the Mahasangikas no longer are around, but they are often compared to the later Mahayana movement in some of their interpretations of doctrine and practice. The actual connection between the Mahasangikas and Mahayana is disputed, though. So what are some of these sectarian doctrines that some of the sects disagreed on? Um, the term schism or Sangha Beda is, as the textbook correctly notes, usually caused over disagreements in discipline. But even if that was the initial cause of the split, and the reason for this, by the way, is that monks, they have to meet um, fortnightly and in other periods as well to basically confess violations of the Vinaya or code. And if they can't agree on what the code is, then 
formally they can't you know be a part of the same body so that's why the vinaya is so important to maintaining the unity of a given group of buddhist monastics but nevertheless even if the schisms often happened initially due to uh code of conduct disagreements these sects would often evolve doctrinal differences over time as well so one example of a now extinct ancient sect of indian buddhism was the pudgalavada or teaching of the person sect and they interpreted the buddha's anatta or not self teaching as still being consistent with the existence of a person or pudgala this is actually rejected by most buddhists but it must be said there are still a lot of disputes between different types of buddhists today over what exactly should be said or thought or taught about the nature of the person or the self or what have you um, an example over another doctrinal dispute was over the nature of the buddha such as whether he was really in a constant state of meditation after attaining enlightenment and thus whether he only appeared to teach or interact with other people etc now that is uh definitely not the view of the Pali canon if you interpret the early scriptures literally he talks he interacts with other people he's not in jhana or meditative absorption all the time but some later buddhists uh, question that um and it's also worth pointing out that doctrinal disputes could happen as well within individual monastic ordination lineages not just between them and like i mentioned before this wouldn't necessarily lead to a formal schism as long as they were agreeing on the vinaya or code of conduct for monks in the picture is king ashoka on the lower right and he is regarded as an ideal buddhist ruler by many uh, especially theravada buddhists and they regard him as presiding over the third buddhist council which also took place in vaishali so a bit more about mahayana buddhism um, the word mahayana is sanskrit for great vehicle and mahayana buddhism started as a movement probably in northern india around the first couple of centuries bc and they taught a new approach or emphasis to buddhism called the bodhisattva path a bodhisattva is a being who is not yet an arhant or a buddha but who makes a vow to become a full-fledged buddha in a future life and the way it's often explained is that they deliberately delay their own enlightenment their own bodhi or experience of full nirvana so that they can continue to be reborn in samsara with the goal of themselves eventually becoming a buddha in a future life to reintroduce the dharma to a universe and help save all the other sentient beings in that universe so from the mahayana perspective the bodhisattva path is more compassionate than that of just becoming an arhant because an arhant if you're lucky you might attain enlightenment within one lifetime but once you do that you are outside of samsara you're not going to be reborn in there subsequently you cannot teach the dharma or help other sentient beings who are still suffering attain release and also there's a view common among buddhists generally but also in mahayana that buddhas have these perfections or paramitas which are various types of knowledge and virtue and even powers that are much greater than that of an arhant and so the goal of becoming a full-fledged buddha is regarded as more worthy in mahayana buddhism um, so these new doctrines were taught in the mahayana sutras which were attributed to the buddha or his chief disciples but were in fact authored uh, several centuries later it's also common in mahayana buddhism to worship many other buddhas or bodhisattvas not just siddhartha Gautama or shakyamuni they have a whole pantheon if you will of other beings that they revere such as maitreya buddha who uh, is going to be the next buddha in the next age after uh, shakyamuni or the founder of buddhism 
And then also Avalokiteshvara would be another example, the Bodhisattva of compassion. And these uh, Buddhas slash Bodhisattvas are sometimes shown in a trinity or trio. There's different trinities though. Um, uh, the thing that was also uh, innovative though about Mahayana is they were some of the first Buddhists to start using statues and paintings, images or murtis of the Buddha as a focus for worship because apparently that was not a part of the earliest form of Buddhism. So for example, the Buddha himself didn't apparently uh, worship images of other Buddhas or Bodhisattvas. So the author of this particular chapter of the textbook, Paul Williams, has a lot to say about the distinction between Theravada and Mahayana. He feels it's often taught or explained incorrectly because Mahayana is not a sect in the same way that Theravada is. Mahayana is not technically a monastic ordination lineage. Rather, it is a kind of ideology or doctrine that historically emerged within multiple different ordination lineages. And so technically, even though Theravada Buddhism is usually distinguished from Mahayana as a separate branch, like different sects of Buddhism, if you will, uh, it's technically correct that a Theravada monk could nevertheless be a follower of Mahayana because Theravada is an indication of their ordination lineage, not of whether they agree with the Bodhisattva path doctrine. That is technically correct. However, for the most part, there's not a lot of overlap. Most Theravadins do not actually follow Mahayana or the Bodhisattva path. So let's talk a bit more about the Mahayana view of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So technically, Theravada uh, or non-Mahayana Buddhists would agree that there are multiple Buddhas. Each age and each universe has its own Buddha. And they also agree about the existence of Bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas are a term used by both Mahayana and Hinayana or non-Mahayana Buddhists to refer to a being who's close to becoming a Buddha, perhaps in their next incarnation. Um, however, what is uh, unique to Mahayana is the doctrine that Buddhas will still interact with samsara even after their pari nirvana, their uh, final experience uh, of samsara. They shed their last body and so then they're completely uh, extinguished or pari nirvana. They have no more foothold in samsara. They just experience liberation uh, in some unclassifiable way forever. But according to Theravada, these beings will not technically be able to interact with samsara. They are not going to answer prayers, for example, or reincarnate in order to teach the Dharma. But that's not the Mahayana view. The Mahayana view is that the Buddha is a supremely compassionate being, or Buddhas, plural, are supremely compassionate beings. And so they will still try to help people in samsara. And that's actually totally consistent with being a Buddha, totally consistent with experiencing parinirvana in some sense, you can still re-enter samsara. So these are like cosmically powerful, you might say god-like beings, except technically in Buddhism, they transcend even the gods in power. And indeed, some Buddhas even create their own worlds or lands or realms within samsara. And the purpose of this is so that they can manifest a body to teach the Dharma to other sentient beings directly. And a lot of Mahayana Buddhists will pray to a Buddha like Amitabha, the Buddha of the Pure Land, so that after the death of their current body, they can be reborn in a Pure Land or another Buddha realm, and thus more easily attain enlightenment from there. And there are many dozens uh, or perhaps even hundreds of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas that are worshipped in Mahayana Buddhism. There are just a couple of examples on the slide, including uh, Avalokiteshvara, who's the one who's depicted in this image, as well as Manjushri, the Buddha of wisdom. And indeed, many of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are associated with a particular virtue or a particular type of wisdom or knowledge or teaching facility. They all have their own little domains of expertise. And in that way, even though they're not technically for the most part the same as gods or heavenly beings in Buddhism, 
they function as a kind of pantheon of enlightened beings that are prayed to, especially by Mahayana Buddhists. The aforementioned king, Ashoka the Great, was an important early supporter of Buddhism. So he was an emperor in the Mauryan dynasty, which ruled much of India in the 3rd century BC. They had their capital at Padaliputra in the land of Magadha, which corresponds to the modern state of Bihar. This was really the main political and to a certain extent, the religious and cultural center of India in this stage of its history. The Mauryas were the first to conquer most of South Asia and unite what we now think of as India into a single empire. And they were apparently partly inspired, at least partly, by both the Persian Empire to their west and the later empire of Alexander the Great, which was established to their west as well. So according to the way um, the Buddhists see the story, Ashoka was a supporter of Buddhism. He converted to Buddhism at some point. Although uh, scholars think he probably also promoted other religions and he might not have actually thought of himself as only a Buddhist specifically. But the way the story is told, uh, he first conquered Southern India in the Kalinga War. And this was really the first time that a Northern Indian kingdom uh, was ruling in the south. He wasn't the first Mauryan uh, king or emperor. His predecessors had uh, managed to conquer most of northern India, but he extended the empire to the south. But in so doing, he had to direct the killing of thousands of people. And he later claimed uh, to regret this, to repent of it, and he tried to live in a more just, nonviolent, and tolerant way. He erected pillars all over his empire, that taught uh, moral virtues and you know wise proverbs and things, and also his laws. So he's regarded as a really enlightened monarch, as someone who united India together. Uh, many Hindus and just other modern Indians look at Ashoka as the kind of predecessor of the modern nation of India because he united the whole subcontinent together. Um, according to the Buddhists, after his conversion to Buddhism, he built many stupas. This is a burial mound, essentially, which houses relics of a Buddha or another enlightened being, and also temples to Buddhism. Building stupas and temples is a great act of merit or good karma in Buddhism, and a lot of kings and other wealthy people would try to do that. He also sent Buddhist missions throughout the empire and beyond to spread the religion. Uh, and presided over the third Buddhist council in Vaishali. Uh, so according to Sri Lankan tradition, Sri Lanka is the name of an island off the south coast of India. Uh, Ashoka's son, Mahinda, was a Buddhist monk, and he was actually the one who led the Buddhist mission to Sri Lanka and helped bring Theravada Buddhism there around 225 BC. So a bit more about the spread of Buddhism throughout Asia uh, and just its historical development. Around 100 BC, maybe a little bit earlier, Mahayana Buddhism began to emerge in northern India. And as the author of the chapter points out correctly, this was not originally a separate sect or ordination lineage, but spread within the already existing sects of Buddhism that were there in the north, probably in the north. Um, we don't know. It, its origins are a bit murky. But one of the things that was characteristic of Mahayana Buddhists, in addition to the Bodhisattva path and all that, was worshipping images of, God, of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in temples. Um, around And then Mahayana Buddhism started to spread gradually throughout the rest of India or South Asia. Around 50 BC, um, Mahayana Buddhism reached China by the Silk Road. So the Silk Road is the main ancient trade artery. They're actually different arteries, but they're collectively called the Silk Road that linked China in the east to uh, the Middle East and Europe uh, in the west. And the real connection between them was the steppe lands and the deserts of Central Asia. And even though there was another direct route as the crow flies that was shorter, between northern India and China, that route goes over the Himalayan mountains and the Tibetan plateau, 
which make travel very difficult. So in fact, it was easier for Buddhism to spread along with the merchant caravan routes that went from northern India to the northwest, what's now Afghanistan, and from there to Central Asia and from there to China. So it took several centuries for Buddhism to become super popular in China and take hold, but it definitely started to spread more by the first couple of centuries AD. Um, and they had both Hinayana and Mahayana Buddhism, but Mahayana became uh, by far the most popular fairly early on. Um, around 372 AD, Buddhism spread to Korea from China. Uh, later on, around 552, it spread to Japan, mainly from Korea. Um, also around 500 AD, give or take, is when you get the emergence of Tantric Buddhism, again, probably in northern India. So we'll talk more about Tantric or Vajrayana Buddhism a bit later. Around 630 AD, Buddhism finally spread to Tibet, both from India and probably from China and Central Asia as well. And the main type of Buddhism that entered Tibet was Vajrayana Buddhism. Uh, and then in the 7th century AD and after, both Theravada and Mahayana Buddhism, together with Hinduism actually, spread to Southeast Asia, including the modern nations of Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, Malaysia, Indonesia. Now, Buddhism, specifically the Theravada kind, is still prominent in the Southeastern Asian nations of Burma or Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos, but it's mostly died out in the nations of Malaysia and Indonesia. And indeed, Buddhism eventually died out for the most part in India itself around, by around the 12th century AD. There was a gradual decline um, out of a lack of royal patronage, competition with Bhakti Hinduism, but also there were some Muslim invasions in the 11 and 1200s that dealt it the final blow. So nowadays, Buddhism is most commonly practiced in Central Asia, like Tibet and Mongolia, in East Asia, like in China, South Korea, and Japan, and also in Southeast Asia, like in Burma or Myanmar, Thailand, and Cambodia. So a bit more about East Asian Buddhism. We'll also talk a bit more about this in the next few chapters on East Asian religions. But as mentioned, Mahayana Buddhism is the type that's prominent in East Asia. Now again, the author of this chapter, Paul Williams, wants to be very careful in how he presents the nature of Mahayana Buddhism and how it's distinct from Theravada. So I'm going to quote directly from him. Quote, it is common, although misleading, to speak of the Buddhism of, for example, China, Japan, and Tibet as Mahayana, as opposed to the Theravada Buddhism of, for example, Southeast Asia. As we have seen, these are not comparable phenomena. Nevertheless, many Mahayana scriptures were transmitted to and usually given unquestioning authority in China, Japan, and Tibet, unlike in Southeast Asia. Buddhists in those countries could be expected to express adherence in one way or another to the Mahayana vision as embracing their highest and final aspirations, unquote. So, in other words, it's definitely true that Mahayana Buddhism is more prominent in East Asia than in Southeast Asia. Um, even though he's very careful about the details and he's technically correct, I don't think it's that big of a mm, fabrication or distortion to say Theravada Buddhism is the type practiced predominantly in South and Southeast Asia, and Mahayana Buddhism is the type practiced in East Asia. You could also, by the way, mention Central Asia, like Tibet, Mongolia, Nepal, Bhutan, as practicing Mahayana Buddhism, because even though they mainly practice Vajrayana, that is kind of like an offshoot of Mahayana itself. So he's technically right, but we don't actually lose too much detail or distort things too much just through the simpler claim that Theravada is common in the South and Southeast, Mahayana is common in East Asia. By the way, in the picture, this is of uh, some East Asian Buddhists, and they often practice veneration of Buddhas along with that of their ancestors. So Buddhism is often connected to ancestor worship in China and other East Asian nations, in part because the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are regarded as protectors of deceased uh, spirits or beings in their next lives or incarnations. 
One of the prominent schools of East Asian Buddhism is the Zen or Chan school. Zen is the Japanese name more commonly known in the West, but it's the Japanese version of the Chinese school of Chan Buddhism. And Chan is the Chinese pronunciation of the Sanskrit word dhyana, which means meditation or meditative absorption. So this was a school of Mahayana Buddhism that was especially focused on meditation practice. And they developed a lot of distinctive teachings and practices. One of their distinct teachings is has to do with the notion that enlightenment involves a direct nonverbal, that is not scripturally or textually mediated, intuitive insight into the nature of the mind, you could say, or just of conditioned existence. So they downplayed studying the scriptures or sutras, at least relative to some of the other ancient Chinese uh, Buddhist schools. Um, they also have a distinctive form of meditation called Qiguan Datsuo in Chinese or Shikantaza in Japanese, which is translated as just sitting meditation. So the idea is it's meditation without having a specific theme or object of focus like the breath. You just kind of look at the mind itself. At least that's one way of putting it. The idea is that it is supposed to be beyond description, beyond a simple instruction. You're just confronting the reality of your own consciousness or your own experience directly. Um, Chan or Zen also employs shock tactics and tries to induce a sudden enlightenment experience, which is a kind of aha or moment of intuition or clarity. Examples of their attempts to prompt this are slapping meditating monks on the back to kind of shock them while they're meditating. Um, this perhaps was also used to try to wake people up who might have fallen asleep. Um, meditating on these things called gong an in Chinese or koan in Japanese. Literal meaning is case record or precedent. So the idea is these are older stories of an interaction sometimes called an encounter dialogue by scholars between a Chan master and a Chan student where the master says something or even gestures in a certain way that provokes an aha moment in the student or that is supposed to provoke an aha moment or an intuition or a sudden enlightenment experience in whoever is meditating on it today. And the idea is Chan, on the one hand, they believe in sudden enlightenment, but they also believe that you may have to meditate with great discipline for years or decades in order to provoke that sort of sudden experience. So um, one of the founders of Chan Buddhism, Hui Nung, even says that enlightenment is neither sudden nor gradual, but maybe it has aspects of each, you could say. Um, it's also a common uh, practice of the Chan and Zen schools to express their wisdom or their insight through the arts like painting or poetry. And they also usually believe in the Buddha nature, which is that the mind uh, of every sentient being has this intrinsic nature that's already enlightened. Now, interpreted in some ways, this could actually contradict the Buddha's not self teaching or his teaching in the Pali Canon that the mind is not inherently pure or impure, but it is whatever a person makes of it or a sentient being makes of it through their karma, through their intention. Whereas in East Asian Buddhism, not only in Chan and Zen, but also in that school, they tend to emphasize that the original nature of the mind is enlightened and that this is why we have the capacity to attain full enlightenment in the first place. So Bodhidharma, who is shown meditating facing the wall of a cave uh, in this picture on the slide, he, according to uh, Chan tradition, is the one who brought this teaching from India to China. Historically speaking, it probably originated in China and doesn't actually have a connection to India. But he's regarded as the first master or patriarch of Chan in China. And uh, his lineage of teachers went back to the Buddha himself. And he spent years meditating against the wall of this cave near uh, Shaolin Monastery in China before he attained enlightenment. 
And also shown in the lower left of the picture is the Chinese monk Hui Ge, who wanted to study under him because of his reputation for being a powerful meditator, but couldn't get Bodhidharma's attention. So after asking twice to take him on as a student and Bodhidharma just ignoring him, continuing his meditation, Hui Ke, according to the legendary version of the story, but it is the traditional one, cut his hand off. And that got Bodhidharma's attention and also showed how disciplined and devoted Wei Ke was. So there's an idea in Chan and Zen Buddhism that you have to literally be willing to sacrifice everything to have this intense discipline and focus in order to be able to tame the mind and gain enlightenment. Shinran Buddhism is another type of East Asian Mahayana Buddhism. This one is distinctively Japanese. It was founded by Shinran, a Japanese Buddhist monk who lived from 1173 to 1263. And uh, it does focus on devotion to Amida Buddha or Amitabha Buddha. Amida is how Amitabha is referred to in Japanese. So this is the Buddha of the Pure Land who creates that Buddha realm for other beings to be reborn in. And uh, Pure Land Buddhism is common throughout East Asia. It's not unique to Japan, but Shinran developed a specific version of it. He taught that the only way to attain enlightenment in the current age is through the grace of the Buddha Amida. That our own power, Jiriki, or self-power, is too diluted, too corrupt, it uh, cannot be relied upon because of our flaws, our limited um, knowledge and the impurity of our mind, at least in the current age. We cannot save ourselves. We must rely upon the grace, the other power, the Tariki of Amida Buddha. Um, he also taught an um, even more radical doctrine, which is that becoming a monk, even practicing meditation, could be an irrelevant distraction and a possible source of attachment because the Buddha's grace is supposed to be sufficient to save everyone, to let anyone be reborn in the pure land and then from there to attain nirvana. And so it shouldn't really matter technically whether you're a monk, whether you even practice meditation. Rather, they have chants or mantras honoring, calling upon the assistance of Amida Buddha for the sake of rebirth in the pure land. So now, a bit more about Tantric or Vajrayana Buddhism. This is named after the Tantras, which are various texts uh, attributed to the Buddha, but actually authored from around the 7th century AD and after. And these texts contain teachings about mantras or special chants and other rituals that can be used to hasten or facilitate or even to provoke suddenly the path to enlightenment. Um, tantric Buddhism, like a tantric Hinduism, they, they share some beliefs, practices, terminology, and imagery, despite the fact that they have different theologies and different theories of salvation or soteriology. They uh, have this in common. They are both esoteric for the most part. So some of the teachings are kept secret and they're only allowed to be taught to approved disciples or initiates and you have to basically form a personal relationship with a guru or teacher and get those secrets as part of your initiation um, so you would be taught certain mantras mandalas which are uh, basically um, geometric patterns they're usually bilaterally symmetrical they may be circles or squares that have diagrams of the different directions with signs of the Buddhas um, that are presiding over different parts of the world, or they may be um, a kind of uh, sacred geometry associated with a god or a goddess or some enlightened being. Um, they can be used as objects of visualization, meditation. That's one of the ways they're used in Vajrayana. Um, and the idea is that there are also these mantras of sacred power. You could look at them as magic. You could look at them as sacred words or phrases that when they're uttered with the right state of mind can have what you might think of as magical or miraculous effects on the world, on samsara, but also can be used to facilitate the path to nirvana. 
Um, so in uh, Tantric uh, Buddhism, they often emphasize the existence of the Siddhis, miraculous powers. Now, all Buddhists, uh, at least traditional ones, believe in Siddhis. These are things like being able to um, see into your past lives, see or hear things that are far away. So these are like psychic or miraculous powers that enlightened beings or beings who are very far on the path to enlightenment may gain through their meditation practice. They're talked about by the Buddha in the Pali Canon and other Buddhist scriptures, but they're especially emphasized in uh, Tantric Buddhism, in Vajrayana. And so a lot of the beings that are revered or worshipped by Vajrayana Buddhists are Siddhas, beings who have these miraculous powers, and there's lots of stories told about them. Another distinctively Vajrayana practice is called deity yoga, yoga here being used in the sense of meditation. Uh, so in deity yoga, the practitioner will usually visualize a god or goddess um, or some other enlightened being. So there's con kind of a lot of overlap, especially in Vajrayana Buddhism, between gods on the one hand and buddhas or bodhisattvas on the other. And it's because uh, in Vajrayana, many of the gods are also simultaneously regarded as Buddhas or Bodhisattvas, such as a Buddha incarnating as a particular um, god in Samsara, or a god who has themselves become a follower of a Buddha and is on the Bodhisattva path. So the idea is by visualizing yourself as the deity, uh, and also by putting yourself in their posture, their asana, and having even their gesture or mudra, uh, and chanting their mantra, you can take on the good qualities, the virtues, the wisdom, the powers of the deity, and which will facilitate your path to enlightenment. So Vajrayana literally means the diamond or thunderbolt vehicle. Vajra can mean either diamond or thunderbolt. Traditionally, it's the weapon of Indra, the storm god and king of the gods in Hinduism. Um, they do believe in Indra in Buddhism, by the way, but Indra is not regarded usually as a Buddha or Bodhisattva. Rather, his weapon is being used here as a symbol of its great power. So in Tantric Buddhism, they use the Vajra as a symbol of the spiritual power you get through their special practices. Um, and it does incorporate a lot of the ideas of Mahayana Buddhism as well, such as the Bodhisattva path and a lot of the same Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And that is why it's often regarded as a branch of Mahayana Buddhism. Um, tantric Buddhism is also known for the practice of tantric sex or karma mudra. And this is one aspect of a larger set of doctrines and practices that is distinctive of Vajrayana Buddhism. It is similar to some of the beliefs and practices of Tantric Hinduism, however. Like Tantric Hinduism, Tantric Buddhism can be divided into right-handed and left-handed paths. The right-handed, uh, you could think of them, if you will, as the normal or the type of Vajrayana Buddhists that are more similar to other Buddhists, they do use the distinctive Vajrayana practices of mantras, mudras, mandalas, and all that, but they don't use the antinomian or practices that seem shocking, immoral, or go against the norms and customs of ordinary Buddhists and other societies and cultures, such as engaging in sex as a spiritual ritual, handling skulls or ashes of dead people, etc. So there are some tantric Buddhists that would go around with a skull or drink from a skull. And the basic idea in both Hindu and Buddhist Tantra with these antinomian practices or things that go against the norms of society is that they are trying to shock themselves out of their complacency out of their disgust their normal emotions trying to transcend all of their attachments all of their ego so tantric buddhism is often depicted as a shortcut or a more direct route to enlightenment that enables through these special rituals the experience of enlightenment or buddhahood within one lifetime so um let's talk more about the role of passion specifically in 
tantric buddhism now passion would usually be connected to craving and clinging and thus it would be the opposite of what any buddhist would want to cultivate but this is what is distinctive of vajrayana buddhism in general they do think that you can harness passion and kind of divert it towards the path to enlightenment so they believe in working with the unenlightened or the um, unspiritual or the common passions of any person's mind and trying to harness that energy towards a more enlightened pure and spiritual direction specifically you can think of passion desire or craving as generally aiming at happiness or at bliss but it's just that the way it operates the things it goes for it's going to be frustrated in attaining true happiness or true bliss or true freedom so what you do is you kind of work with that passion and its goal or its aim and you just redirect it from something physical you might say or something worldly to something transcendent uh you know the word transcendent can be a bit tricky here but the basic idea is you're channeling that passion to nirvana or to becoming a buddha so there's three different levels or practices of this in um tantric buddhism number one visualizing male and female deities in sexual union which is called yabiyom uh, in tibetan uh, vajrayana you can see on the slide some pictures of that so at this level or in this practice you're not actually engaging in sex yourself but you are visualizing these deities in union and the union is regarded as partly symbolic as expressing the union of the two sides of enlightenment the male side symbolizes compassion in vajrayana buddhism the female side symbolizes wisdom and these are regarded as two parts of a harmonious whole of enlightened consciousness the second practice or phase of the use of passion in tantric buddhism is through manipulating the energies you could call it the prana the breath energy the vital energy of your own body and mind to create heat which is called tumo in tibetan this appears to be similar to the uh, ancient indian notion of tapas ascetic practices that create heat energy uh, and which can then be used to help purify the mind um, the difference though is the idea of not just using normal ascetic practices like fasting or meditating for a long period or sitting outside in one posture um, etc but rather trying to use passion itself to create this spiritual heat which will then purify the mind and then the third phase or aspect of the practice is karma mudra or the so-called tantric sex so this is generally only done or supposed to be done by uh, tantric buddhists who are already skilled at the tumo phase so they've already mastered meditation and their vital energy manipulations to a certain degree that when they have the sex act it's not just going to be mundane or normal and in fact you are not supposed to achieve orgasm uh at least you're not supposed to ejaculate if you're a male doing the tantric sex because the idea is you arouse the vital energy through the sex act but then you don't allow it to achieve its normal mundane completion rather you try to channel that energy and that bliss to purify and enlighten the mind chapter 19 sacred writings for the first several centuries of its history the dharma or teaching of the buddha was transmitted orally similar to the way that the veda the ancient hindu scripture was transmitted in ancient india um, according to the buddhist tradition the monks after the death of the buddha the parinirvana of the buddha met at the first council at vaishali and recited the entire pali canon together uh, certain monks would specialize in memorizing parts of the pali canon because it was so huge hundreds of different texts for example um, each of which you know would be hundreds of lines long at least 
uh, it was not possible for one person to memorize it all, but they would memorize large chunks of it. And that is still done today. Buddhist monks will chant, recite, memorize large versions of their, or large portions of their scripture. So this continued for several centuries, but eventually the Pali Canon was written down by Theravada Buddhists in Sri Lanka in the first century BC. And apparently this happened after a period of some kind of disruption that created a bottleneck in the number of monks who could recite the scriptures. Uh, so there was a risk that they would have actually have lost the scriptures because at one time there was only one or a small handful of monks who knew certain parts of the scripture. So they wrote it down to preserve it for later generations. Um, and the view of modern scholars is that some of the Pali Canyon probably does go back to the original Buddha and his early disciples, but other parts were added later. The Buddhist canon, and this is true not only of the Pali canon, which is the oldest complete um, ancient version of the Buddhist scriptures, but also this is true of the various Mahayana uh, canonical scriptures, but it's customarily divided into three parts, which is called Tipitaka in the Pali language or Tripitaka in Sanskrit. You can translate it as triple or three baskets. The first basket is the Sutta or Sutra Pitaka. And by the way, um, the reason why there are often alternate spellings for the same word is because the first one is in the Pali language, which is a later form of Sanskrit. And that was the language in which the first complete collection of the Buddhist scriptures was recorded. The second version in the example of Sutta, that's the Pali, the second version, Sutra, is Sanskrit. And even though Sanskrit is the more ancient form of the language, it was actually mainly used in a later time after the Buddha was alive for the Buddhist scriptures. And the reason why that happened is because Pali was reflecting the way the language was spoken around the time the Buddha was alive. But eventually, in centuries after, the language had changed again. And rather than writing the scriptures in the various different languages that had evolved out of Sanskrit in different parts of India, rather, they used Sanskrit, the classical ancient language of the Veda, as the language of their scriptures because it was the language that was understood, could be spoken and written by scholars and Brahmins or priests all across India. So it was the standard language of later Indian scholarship, just as Latin was of Europe in the Middle Ages, long after the Roman Empire had ended in the West and Latin was no longer spoken in everyday life. So Sanskrit, even though it's the older form of the language, um, the Buddhist scriptures in Sanskrit tend to be less old, less ancient than the Pali version. The second, uh, the first part of the Tripitaka was the suttas or sutras of the Buddha, so his discourses or sermons. The second part was the Vinaya, the code of conduct for monks and nuns. And the third part, which was probably not going back to the Buddha himself, was probably written after the death of the Buddha. It's called the Abhidhamma in Pali or the Abhidharma in Sanskrit, Pitaka, which means the higher or the further Dharma or teaching. This consists of an attempt to systematize Buddhist doctrine as a coherent uh, worldview of metaphysics and other types of philosophy. And these are only the three main subdivisions of the canonical scriptures. Each of those Pitakas has numerous subdivisions of its own. So in the Pali Canon, the Sutra Pitaka or Sutta Pitaka is divided into five Nikayas or collections, each of which has many, many individual sutras. So um, the Canon was closed around 150 years after the death of the Buddha. So that's an estimate, but at least the ancient Pali version of the Canon Probably the latest parts of the Pitaka were composed around 150 years after his death. Although that does not include the commentaries given to the original scriptures by later generations of monks as well. Um, the Vinaya and especially the Abhidhamma Pitakas were closed much later though. There's also texts that are not technically part of the canon but are kind of derived from it or closely associated with it. 
a prominent example being the Prati Moksha or the monastic code of conduct. The rules of this are derived from the Vinaya Pitaka. The difference is that in the Vinaya Pitaka, the rules are embedded in the form of stories of occasions from the life of the Buddha where something happened in the Sangha that caused him to author that rule. But they were collected in a way that's more summarized and easier to follow as a code of conduct in the later Pratimoksha text. So as I mentioned, Pali Canon is used by Theravada Buddhists, but other types of Buddhists will have different Abhidhammas and different sutras as well. The uh, Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhists have their own canons. Most East Asian Buddhists are Mahayanists and they use a version of the Chinese Tripitaka, parts of which go back to Sanskrit originals from India, but parts of which were probably originally composed in China in later centuries. The picture on the slide is a complete modern printed edition of the Pali Canon. So you can see it does not fill just one volume, unlike the Christian Bible. Rather, it fills, you know, dozens of large printed texts. And it's just a much larger collection. And this, what you're seeing right now, would be the complete Sutra and Vinaya Pitakas. The um, publisher of this, by the way, is the Polytext Society, or PTS, which was founded in Great Britain in the late 1800s, and they publish both Pali language and English language editions of the Pali Canon. So Pali, as I mentioned, is the language of the oldest complete collection of the Buddhist scriptures, but there's also snippets or fragments of the scriptures in Sanskrit and other ancient Indian languages. Um, Pali in particular was a standardized dialect that was composed by kind of mashing together elements of different dialects or Prakrits spoken across North India and around the time of the Buddha and after his death. These Prakrits were various languages derived from Old Indo-Aryan, or the ancient language of the Aryans, the text form of which is known as Sanskrit. Um, and the reason why Pali was developed is because it was kind of a middle dialect that could be understood by people who had different local dialects in different parts of northern India. It was probably similar to what the Buddha was speaking, but not the exact language or dialect of the Buddha. Um, so Pali is used by Theravada Buddhists. Their original scriptures are all written in Pali. And Theravada, in a sense, is the oldest surviving school of Buddhism. It's the only one that goes back to ancient India, although they have many practices and beliefs that have changed and developed over the centuries as well. So as mentioned, there were versions of the ancient Buddhist canon in Sanskrit and other languages in ancient India. Uh, and then in the later period, so we're talking about from the Mahayana period onward, from the first century or two BC and onward, many Buddhist scriptures were often written in Sanskrit. They stopped using Pali as the language for new Buddhist texts in India itself, although Pali did see continued use in Sri Lankan Theravada Buddhism uh, south of India. Um, and if you look at Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhism, they often use the Sanskrit versions of Buddhist terms like karma, whereas the Pali version is kamma, spelled in the Roman alphabet K-A-M-M-A. -M -M -A. And with English, it gets a bit confusing because many of the terms that are familiar to us to describe Buddhism, like karma, dharma, those are the Sanskrit versions of the words whereas other versions that are more commonly known may be from Pali. So it's kind of a mishmash, although it's also worth pointing out that some terms like Buddha are the same in both languages. And then the other um, canons that are still used today, the most common are the Chinese uh, Mahayana scriptures, the Chinese Tripitaka. There's also a Tibetan language canon that's used by a lot of Vajrayana Buddhists. 
Um, so the Mahayana Sutras, which were authored after the time of the Buddha, they're called apocryphal by this chapter in the textbook. Apocryphal basically means uh, invalid or illegitimate or not authentic. Um, Mahayana Buddhists, of course, believe that their sutras are authentic. They claim they do go back to the time of the Buddha. They acknowledge that they were not immediately taught or promulgated until centuries after the Buddha's life. But the Mahayana explanation for this is that because they contain these deeper or more profound teachings, the Buddha strategically hid them by giving them to Nagas or earth spirits that took them underground and kept them until such the time was right to reveal them strategically to particular advanced uh, monks who were on the Bodhisattva path or other people too. So, you know, that's probably not historically accurate, but that's how Mahayana Buddhists explain their new sutras allegedly go back to the Buddha himself. The textbook makes a really interesting point that the Mahayana Sutra is probably spread through being written down, unlike the original Pali and other ancient canons. And this was uh, important because it allowed them to be spread even outside the traditions of oral transmission and recitation. So it's hard to introduce new sutras to a Buddhist uh, sect if they're not already a part of the liturgy or they're not already part of the various other ceremonies uh, performed or texts that are chanted as part of the routines um, of the monks. But if you have these texts in written form, then they can be spread that way among monks. And that's exactly what happened with the Mahayana Sutras. They probably date back to the first century or two BC in North India, but they pretty quickly spread like wildfire throughout large parts of Central, East, South, and Southeast Asia. The Tantras, these are the texts associated with Vajrayana Buddhism. Um, and this is the type of Buddhism that's commonly practiced today in Tibet, Mongolia, and some other parts of Central Asia. Now, there are also versions of Vajrayana Buddhism, primarily in East Asia, somewhat in Southeast Asia as well. In China, they're known as Chanyan, which is the Chinese word for mantra. In Japan, they're known as Shingon, which is just the Japanese pronunciation, if you will, of Chanyan. But they've always been less prominent in East Asia than the various forms of Mahayana Buddhism, such as Pure Land. Shastra in Buddhism is a term that's often used to refer to later scholastic or scholarly treaties, treatises that were intended to systematize, explain, clarify various points of Buddhist doctrine. The literal meaning is something like a collection of texts. Um, and a famous example is the Abhidharma Kosha, uh, compiled by the Buddhist scholar monk Vazu Bandhu. Um, so this is a compendium used by a lot of Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhists. But every Buddhist country has produced its own shastras and other exegetical or interpretive works over the centuries. Chapter 20, Beliefs. So before we begin going through some of the main doctrines of Buddhism, it's interesting to consider this one quotation from a sutra in the Anguttara Nikaya of the Pali Canon. And this is a teaching the Buddha gave to a people called the Kalamas. Quote, asked by some citizens of Kalama for guidance, the Buddha said, quote, be not led by reports of tradition or hearsay. Be not led by the authority of religious texts, nor by mere logic or inference, nor by considering appearances. But, O Kalamas, when you know for yourselves that certain things are unwholesome, a kusala in Pali, and wrong and bad, then give them up. And when you know for yourselves that certain things are wholesome, or kusala, and good, then accept them and follow them, unquote and unquote. So this is a famous passage of the Pali Canon, because the Buddha is giving a criterion for how you know the truth. And it's not just from studying religious texts, which in his lifetime would have referred to the Veda, for example, the sacred scripture of Hinduism, 
but also he doesn't say use logic or even appearances. Rather, he's implying to put it to the test, put a doctrine or a practice to the test, apply it in your own life, and then see if it's beneficial or harmful. Wholesome or kusala can be translated also as skillful, unwholesome as unskillful. The idea is you should be able to see the results in your own life, know it by the fruits as it will. And so there's a kind of pragmatic or practical criterion that the Buddha proposes by which you can really test what is part of the Dharma, uh, what is part of the path to Nirvana, and what is not. There's another interesting part of the Pali Canon where the Buddha is talking to Malunkya, uh, who's one of his followers, but Malunkya has a bunch of questions that he really wants the answer to, and they are speculative, philosophical, or metaphysical questions. And what's interesting about this passage in the Malunkya Putta is that um, the Buddha refuses to answer these questions. So these are the 10 questions. One, is the world eternal? Two, is the world not eternal? Three, is the world finite? Four, is the world infinite? Five, are the mind and body the same? Six, is the mind one thing and the body another? Seven, does the Tathagata, that means an enlightened being after they've experienced Parinirvana, literally Tathagata is the one gone, gata, over there, tata. Uh, does such a being exist after death? Eight, does the Tathagata not exist after death? Nine, does the Tathagata both exist and not exist after death? And finally, ten, does the Tathagata neither exist nor not exist after death? The Buddha refuses to answer these, and the justification he gives is essentially that they're not relevant to the path to experience nirvana and to end suffering. Um, and he gives a parable or an extended analogy that Malunkya is behaving like someone who was shot with a poisoned arrow, but he refuses to let a physician treat him from the poison and save his life before he has answers to all these various speculative or irrelevant questions answered, like, what was the varna or caste of the person who shot the arrow? What type of arrow was it? What type of bow did they use? Uh, were they male or female, et cetera, et cetera? All of those questions are not relevant to the practical problem of getting healed from the poison. So the Buddha does teach a lot of doctrines and a lot of theory, but the idea behind this dialogue he has with Malunkya is that he's claiming to only teach things that are relevant to solving the problem of suffering, ending suffering, and transcending samsara. The picture on the slide, by the way, is not depicting his dialogue with Malunkya, but rather um, that of the first uh, sutta or sutra he delivered, the Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta, or turning of the Dharma wheel. And according to the story, that was when he turned the five fellow ascetics over to the first Buddhist monks. So in Buddhism, um, the three main things that most Buddhists worship are the Triratna, the three jewels or the triple gem, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. They do believe in gods and goddesses, at least traditionally in Buddhism. Some Buddhist modernists don't believe in that. But the gods and the goddesses are regarded as, at best, protectors or supporters or followers of the Buddha, um, upholders of the Dharma, beings with good karma that might be in an exalted state of existence now, but they're still below the Buddha in wisdom and power. So the main beings worshipped in Buddhism are, one, the Buddha himself, two, the Dharma or teaching of the Buddha, and three, the Sangha or the order of monks and nuns. The three jewels in Buddhism are symbolized by the Trizula or trident, and the Trizula is the same symbol as the trident of Shiva in Hinduism, or at least it looks similar, but has a different meaning in Buddhism. 
The Trusula is often pictured as shown here in the diagram on the slide, together with the Vajra and the Dhamma Chakra or Dharma Wheel. The Vajra is that diamond or thunderbolt rod that symbolizes the power of Indra, but it is also the power of enlightenment, um, the power of spiritually advanced beings. Uh, it's not only a symbol in Vajrayana Buddhism, it's also used by others too. And then the Dhamma Chakra, of course, symbolizes the Dharma or teaching of the Buddha. So that is the most type, common type of worship or puja in Buddhism is worship of the Buddha himself, which is called Buddha Puja, or worship of the Charatna. And indeed, uh, in order to become a Buddhist, what is required is basically uh, pledging that you will go to the Triple Gem for protection. Um, and this is kind of a parallel with an ancient Indian practice of going to a king or to a lord for protection. By analogy, a Buddhist goes to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha for their protection. So the Dharma is the teaching of the Buddha about, you could say, the nature of reality or of existence with a focus on the problem of suffering, its nature, its cause, its end, and how to bring about its end. And in order to do this, in order to really understand the Dharma, you have to put it into practice. You have to live, act, and see reality in a certain way, even deep into your mind and consciousness. So another part of the Buddha's teaching is the three characteristics of conditioned existence, impermanence, suffering, and not self. So the Buddha teaches that you should perceive a phenomena, that is the ordinary aspects of our physical and mental experience, could include things like visual or auditory perceptions, um, feelings of pleasure or pain, thoughts or concepts, emotions, motives, all of those things are phenomena, but they are impermanent. Anicca in Pali or Anitya in Sanskrit. And also that all of these phenomena are suffering or unsatisfactory, dukkha. They are not things that are worthy, thirdly, of being regarded as self, as I, me, or mine. So all three of these perceptions or characteristics of phenomena are meant to be interrelated, to go together. The not-self teaching, as mentioned before, is interpreted differently by different Buddhists. But a simple way of interpreting it is that all of the aggregates or aspects, or you could say channels uh, or bunches of experience, these things are conditioned. And so are we ourselves, sentient beings, and impermanent. And so they should not be regarded as self. In a way, they are unworthy of being regarded as self because of their being conditioned, impermanent, and suffering. Um, so in Mahayana Buddhism and uh, Vajrayana Buddhism, they also have a particular version of the doctrine of emptiness or shunyata. Um, shunyata is mentioned in the Pali Canon that's used by Theravada Buddhists, but in Mahayana and Vajrayana, it has a broader or expanded meaning. They claim that all beings, whether sentient or not, are empty of inherent existence. And so you have to have deep understanding of this emptiness, how everything is interconnected with and conditioned by everything else. That perception is necessary or it's a part of the awareness of an enlightened being. The original Dharma of the Buddha um, was summarized by him in his first uh, sutra, the turning of the Dharma wheel, as four truths that are called the four noble truths. One, suffering. Two, the cause of suffering. Three, the end or cessation of suffering. And four, the path to bring about the cessation of suffering. The Buddha defines suffering as clinging to what he calls the five aggregates or skandhas. These are the five aspects of our experience that I mentioned previously. Form, feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness. Form includes both sensory perceptions like sights, sounds, colors, textures, etc., and the physical objects that we perceive through sense perception. It includes both. 
feeling and all the other um, of the five aggregates are going to be of mental phenomena. Feeling is a pleasure, pain, or a neutral feeling that is often occasioned by our contact with physical objects or forms. Perception doesn't mean a uh, sense perception. That is mostly included under the first aggregate of form, but rather perception means a, a cognition, a thought that classifies something as being a certain kind of thing or as having a certain property or attribute. So it's an act of the mind. Uh, formation, this is a technical term that refers to uh, karmic activity, really. So this is where karma, where intention often occurs. Um, formation is the mind's manipulation, uh, forming analogously like you're shaping a, a sculpture out of clay. That's one of the visual metaphors given for this. Through having emotion, through having intention, you are actually having uh, or doing karma and you're eventually shaping your experience. And then the fifth aggregate of consciousness is awareness, including awareness of the other aggregates. So the idea is these things are not suffering in and of themselves because an enlightened being like a Buddha can still be alive before Parinirvana and still be experiencing all of these aggregates. Rather, it's the clinging to them in the mind and that activity itself would fall under formation. That is what the suffering is. The second noble truth is that the cause of this clinging, of this suffering is craving or thirst. So it's when we have some kind of desire, some kind of need respective to um, the aggregates. And usually it's craving, for example, for coming into being, for going out of being, or things of that nature. Um, our, the third type of, of craving is uh, involving a, a self-identity or a view of some kind of a self. Uh, the third noble truth is the cessation of suffering or nirodha. And according to the Buddha, suffering only ends or ceases by abandoning its cause, craving or thirst. There's no other way to end it. So that's kind of like the inner meaning of the third noble truth. There's two sides to it. Number one, it's possible for suffering to come to an end. Number two, the only way of doing that is by abandoning its cause, craving or thirst, which is difficult to do. Hence the fourth noble truth, you have to systematically develop or cultivate the path to bring about the end of craving and thus the end of clinging and suffering. And that path is called the Noble Eightfold Path. It has eight main parts, steps, or aspects. And the general view here is that suffering is produced by the beings trapped in samsara. It's produced by their own mental activity, their own craving, which itself is related to or a product of their ignorance or their delusion. So a bit more about the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, these are the eight parts, right view, right resolve, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And these are divided into three main groups, wisdom, morality, and meditation. Wisdom includes the first two steps or parts of the Eightfold Path, right view and right resolve. Um, so the idea of the Eightfold Path is that you're supposed to develop all of these steps together. It's not a linear sequence entirely. There's synergies between the different parts of it, but there is also the view that there's a kind of priority there or logical progression, and that in order to begin on the Eightfold Path, you usually have to start with some amount of wisdom. Right view would include things like seeing your experience through the lens of the Four Noble Truths, seeing suffering in your mind, seeing how it's caused by craving, etc. Right resolve is basically the resolve to lead a life of purity or holiness, to overcome craving, to abandon it, and to attain enlightenment. Um, so the idea is you have to have some right view and right resolve in order to really start seriously on the path to begin with. But from there, you start from the outside, your moral out action, including the physical conduct of your body, 
and then move systematically to train your mind through meditation as well. The three main parts of morality or sila are right speech, right action, and right livelihood. And each of these is broken down into many subparts. For example, right speech includes not lying, but also not gossiping or creating conflicts between people. Right action includes not stealing, not murdering, and so on. Right livelihood basically means uh, living in a way and making a living in a way that does not involve violating any of the other moral rules, like you're not a hunter killing animals or you are not you know, selling guns or things like that. Uh, and then meditation is including right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And this is basically a series of steps to develop and train the mind to make it focused and calm so that it can see the truth and from there attain enlightenment. So a bit more about Buddhist morality. The version from the Noble Eightfold Path is a summary. It's broken down further in a lot of the Buddha's sutras, but there's also a statement of the main rules of right action followed by both monks and lay people that are called the five precepts or pancha sila, the five pancha rules of morality sila. Um, monks and nuns have additional precepts and then a much longer monastic code as well. The first precept is ahimsa or nonviolence, thus to refrain from harming any uh, living being, which is believed to also be in the cycle of samsara. The second precept is not taking what is not given. Uh, the third precept is to not engage in sexual misconduct. For monks and nuns, this means no sexual conduct of any kind. For lay people, it basically means not having sex outside of marriage or with anyone who's not in a permission, uh, in a situation where they can give permission to have sex with them. So there's a variety of aspects the way it's uh, spelled out. But basically for lay people, you're only supposed to marry someone of age with their family's permission and then you have sex within marriage and you don't you know, have affairs and things like that. Um, the fourth precept is to abstain from false speech. And that's kind of a, a summary of the various other rules of right speech that is spelled out more detailed fashion in other statements of um, right speech in the Noble Eightfold Path. And then the fifth precept, this is one not mentioned in the original versions of the Noble Eightfold Path, but it is added relatively early on. It's in the Pali Canon, for example. But abstain from intoxicants which cause heedlessness is one translation of it. They're especially thinking of avoiding alcohol, but anything else that would uh, lower your mind's inhibitions or lower your mind's ability to be disciplined, focused, and aware or conscious, all of that would be bad. So caffeine is usually not thought of as um, against this rule, but alcohol and uh, drugs like heroin would be, for example. Um, and other aspects of Buddhist morality include things like these four Brahma Viharas or sublime states of mind. Uh, number one, loving kindness. Number two, compassion. Number three, sympathetic joy. Number four, equanimity. These are states of mind that, first of all, are characterized by certain Brahmas or divine beings in the heavens, but they're things that are very good to cultivate. Um, and they're basically attitudes of sympathy, of compassion, of friendliness, and of peace towards other beings. And you have to perfect these in order to attain nirvana. There's a notion in Buddhism that there's a deep inner connection between the happiness and well-being of different sentient or conscious beings. So the only way you can secure your own happiness is by also respecting and protecting the happiness of others. The Buddha has a couple of uh, sutras about this. And so there is a very, in a sense, black and white morality in Buddhism in the sense that there are certain actions, uh, kama, that are regarded as wholesome, kusala, um, and there are other actions regarded as unwholesome, akusala, and you have to systematically get rid of all the unwholesome actions, develop and cultivate the wholesome ones. 
Um, one of the later texts from the Pali Canon, the Dhammapada, is a famous summary of Buddhist doctrine. And it states very clearly that your thoughts, your intention, which is like your inner karma, and really how Buddha defines karma is as intention, these will actually shape your own existence. And thus, your thoughts determine your future, determine your path to enlightenment. Meditation is described pretty systematically in both the Pali Canon and later Buddhist sutras. Um, and it corresponds to those last three parts of the Noble Eightfold Path, effort, mindfulness, and concentration. The right effort refers to the fact that meditation does not develop on its own. The mind is not inherently, naturally, or spontaneously pure or trained or enlightened. Rather, you have to make an effort to uproot and avoid unwholesome states of mind and to develop or encourage wholesome states of mind. Um, so that is the basis for the whole meditation practice, is that effort. And then the first stage of meditation itself is called mindfulness or study, which is where you have an object or theme of meditation that you're trying to focus on, like the breath. But it could be other things like mantras or even visualizations. There are many possible objects of meditation that are mentioned both in the Pali Canon and in other Buddhist scriptures. So mindfulness is um, a practice of remembering or returning your mind to that object of meditation or focus. And then meditation proper is really indicated in Buddhism by this word samadhi, which is often translated as concentration. So it's when your mind is focused on one object, it has a certain amount of one pointedness. Um, and you achieve that by practicing mindfulness, by just bringing your mind back, back, back to the one thing until it just is able to stay there for a while. Um, and the basic method uh, for doing this is described by the Buddha. You find a relatively secluded place. It might be in a hut or empty room. It might be in a cave, it might be under a tree as long as it's not too noisy or too boisterous, too many interruptions. You sit with an upright posture. Meditation is also possible in other postures, such as standing or lying down or even walking. But um, sitting with legs crossed and back upright is the common posture. And then you just direct your mind to whatever object or theme of meditation you've chosen. Again, breath or prana is a common one. And when the mind wanders, just bring it back to the theme. And if you practice this consistently, then according to the Buddha, your mind will eventually attain this very refined state of absorption called jhana in Pali or dhyana in Sanskrit. And this is not the same as enlightenment, but it's a necessary step before you can get enlightenment. And it's also why meditation in general is necessary. During the jhanas, and there's different ones with different levels of absorption and different properties, but what they all have in common is the mind is focused on one point, it's very calm, and you have great insight or ability to see things clearly. There's also other meditation themes like loving kindness itself that are often used in meditation. So you can practice deliberately extending friendliness or loving kindness to other beings, that is also a type of Buddhist meditation practice. So um, nowadays it's common, in fact, to distinguish between mindfulness and concentration as if they were two different types of meditation. The uh, Thai trained monk Tanisaro Bhikkhu, who I've mentioned previously, has argued pretty convincingly that this is probably an error and his whole tradition, the Thai forest tradition, which goes back to some uh, Thai monks from the late 1800s uh, and early 1900s, such as Ajahn Lee uh, Damodaro, um, they basically teach that, no, the Buddha's original teaching is that there's just one meditation practice, Samadhi, and mindfulness is more like the method through which you develop Samadhi. Um, so it's supposed to be one unified practice. And then samadhi leads to jhana or dhyana. But um, later uh, Theravada schools uh, or sects 
since the 1800s, many of them have taught that mindfulness and concentration are actually different types of meditation. And they claim that concentration leads to shamatha or calm, whereas mindfulness leads to vipassana or insight. And that vipassana is the one that's more important because it's the one that actually can lead to enlightenment or nirvana. Um, so like I said, I think this is probably a mistake. I think that the Thai forest tradition actually has it right. If you study the Pali Canon very carefully, it does seem like the Buddha is just teaching one continuous type of meditation with these different stages. Uh, and that shamatha or calm and vipassana or insight are usually regarded as going together. They occur together in the jhanas or dhyanas, which is actually why you want those states. But regardless of those kind of um, doctrinal disputes, the inside baseball, Buddhists generally practice meditation, mainly monks, sometimes lay people, because they regard it as necessary for purifying the mind, getting the wisdom necessary for enlightenment. Specifically, you can use meditation to get rid of the kaleshas or poisons from the mind, which are greed, hatred, and delusion or ignorance. The word is moha. Uh, that's translated as delusion or ignorance. So what is the fundamental delusion or ignorance? Well, according to most Buddhists, the basic or central delusion is the belief in a self, uh, in the sense of a permanent, eternal, unconditioned being. Um, or you might reframe it as the delusion is trying to claim things as yourself. So that psychological process of I making, me making, mind making. And once you practice meditation, you can kind of deconstruct, if you will, see through that empty self process and then um, just let go of craving, clinging, and suffering. And uh, we also have the Buddha's teachings on rebirth, the various realms or states of being, states of existence where sentient beings can be reborn based on their past karma. Karma is actually what helps stitch together or unite a sentient being over its lifetime and through multiple lifetimes. The Buddha did not teach there is an eternal, unchanging self or soul that gives identity and unity to a sentient being. Rather, it appears it is that being's own karma that creates the continuity in their experience because they are the ones who will experience the fruit, the pala of their karma, both in this life and in future lives. So there are five uh, realms of rebirth that are taught by the Buddha. A sixth realm was added later. Each of these has many uh, various uh, sub layers or sub classifications within, like for example, different types of animals. But the first realm, the lowest or the worst, is the hell realms. Um, these are where beings are tormented and experience a lot of pain and suffering because of their past sins, their past bad karma. Second is the animal realm, where beings experience a greater amount of delusion or ignorance. Third is the realm of the hungry ghosts or predas, where beings experience a great deal of craving or thirst in a way that can't be satisfied. Fourth is the human realm, where there's a mix of pleasure and pain. Five is the celestial realms, or heavens, where devas, brahmas, and other beings experience a more blissful state, some sublime states of mind because of their past good karma. And the sixth realm that was added later is that of the asuras, which in Buddhism are interpreted as jealous or angry gods, whose existence, they're, they're powerful beings like gods, but they're dominated by um, this kind of passion, this wrath, this hatred. Um, so the diagram shown in the slide, the Baba Chakra, this is often used in Vajrayana Buddhism, but it illustrates the beliefs, the cosmology of most Buddhists. So you can see in the center is three animals, a bird, a snake, and a pig. Those are representing the three kaleshas or poisons. Those are what keep the wheel of samsara going. The second circle has a left half that is white and a right half that is black. The right half that's black symbolizes bad karma that causes the being to reborn on a lower realm of existence. And the white half 
is symbolizing good karma, which causes a being to ascend to a higher realm of existence. But all of these realms, even the high ones, are still in samsara. They still are impermanent. They're still going to have death and loss and separation and suffering. And so the goal is to transcend this altogether, to go above the wheel of samsara. And to the right of this is shown the Buddha pointing the way to the Dharma wheel. And he is an example of a being who is outside of samsara, who has transcended it, who has experienced nirvana. And the demonic looking being that is holding the wheel of samsara, that's Mara, whom Buddhists believe um, exist in the universe. He's like um, a devil or a tempter god, an evil being. He actually is just another being within samsara. And every single world system or universe has its own Mara. But he actually tries to tempt beings to stay in samsara, even though he's also a part of it. Um, also not shown on the diagram on the slide, but a part of Buddhist cosmology or theory of existence is the pure lands or Buddha realms that according to Mahayana Buddhists are created. These would also be elsewhere within samsara, but they would be a privileged place from which to more easily transcend the wheel and attain nirvana. Nirvana, you could think of metaphorically as a place outside of samsara, outside of the wheel, like above it. But technically, according to the Buddha, after the death of the last body of an enlightened being, so when they're in the state of pari nirvana, their existence can't be defined. They neither exist nor not exist, nor both nor neither. But that is the non-place place, so to speak, in which arhants and Buddhas uh, are existent or present in some sense. And so uh, with respect to Mah uh, Mahayana Buddhism, where they have the Bodhisattva vow, the goal is to become a Buddha, not a mere Arhan, for the sake of liberating all other sentient beings from samsara. And the difference is that an Arhan, once you attain that, you slip outside of the wheel altogether and you're just out there in nirvana, so to speak, chilling with the Buddha. Whereas a Buddha they are incarnated in samsara to reintroduce the dharma and their teaching helps many many other beings attain enlightenment chapter 21 buddhism in the modern world so the story of the decline of buddhism in india is uh, a bit murky um and it was a long complex process um, basically, there was a period of gradual decline over several centuries, and then um, a kind of sudden period that only lasted for a century or two in which there were a lot of Muslim invasions attacking, destroying some of the main remaining Buddhist temples and monasteries, which is kind of like the final crushing blow. So um, after the death of the Buddha, Buddhism actually spread throughout India for several centuries. It was promoted by kings and emperors like Ashoka the Great and by some later dynasties as well. There also was a class of seagoing merchants who uh, handled a lot of the trade with India over the ocean who promoted Buddhism. But they were eventually replaced by Arab merchants. Um, there were also later dynasties of kings in India that for whatever reason stopped promoting Buddhism and were mainly promoting Hinduism and also um, Jainism to a lesser degree. And then there was the rise of bhakti or devotional Hinduism, which proved very popular and stole a lot of followers, so to speak, from Buddhism. Buddhism did remain even after all these reversals of fortune, but it became mainly concentrated in monasteries and universities in a few locations in northern India, such as at Taxila and Nalanda. And this set the stage for its final downfall. There were a series of invasions into northern India, mainly via the Khyber Pass in the Hindu Kush Mountains to the northwest, uh, what's now Afghanistan. Various peoples, different types of Huns, Turks, and Mongols, and some of these attacked and destroyed Buddhist monasteries. The main uh, killing blow was during the foundation of the Delhi Sultanate, the first uh, Muslim dynasty to establish control of India. Its founder, Qutub Uddin Ibak, conquered northeastern India, the original heartland of Buddhism, and destroyed Mahabodhi Temple in Bodh Gaya, 
the place where the Buddha attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. This was in the late 12th century. And one of his generals, Iktiar Uddin Muhammad bin Bakhtiar Kilji, also invaded Magadha and destroyed the Buddhist Nalanda University and other sites. So a lot of monks were killed, a lot of the texts were destroyed. They never recovered. Some of the survivors fled to the south and other places. But for the most part, after that, Buddhism was gone in India, so after the 12th century. And the few remaining uh, temples and uh, were basically destroyed by the next Muslim dynasty, the Mughals, and some were converted into mosques. There were a few Buddhists remaining in the north, in the Himalayas, um, who tended to practice Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhism. And also, Buddhism survived in Sri Lanka, the island off the south coast of India. But other than that, Buddhism mainly died out in India itself. So uh, later on, after the Muslim dynasties established in India, there were a series of European powers. First, uh, Portugal, then other countries like the Netherlands and France and England and even uh, Denmark and some others who established colonies mainly on parts of the coast of India for the purpose of trade. But later, France and England started to get more involved in uh, Buddhist, or sorry, Indian politics. And France and England fought a war and England won and they ended up dominating the Mughal dynasty which ruled a lot of the interior of India and eventually England or Great Britain took over um, all of India, all of South Asia, including uh, Burma. So um, exactly how European colonialism played out was different in different parts of Asia. Uh, Sri Lanka was actually a separate um, British colony um, and the British basically took power over from the previous Theravada Buddhist supporting Candian kingdom around 1815 and the British ruled Sri Lanka until 1948. Um, Burma, the nation now known as Myanmar, uh, also became a British, a British colony uh, over a long period. It's kind of like a gradual process. So from around 1793 to 1885, and uh, Burma did not gain its independence until 1948. In terms of Southeast Asia, so the modern nations of Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, those were a French colony known as French Indochina. And France began to take them over in 1864. They became independent after the end of World War II in 1945. Um, and then in China, China retained its independence, but there were foreign powers who had legal rights and quasi-colonies in different parts of China, especially along the East Coast in the late 1800s. And then later on, in the first half of the 20th century, Japan invaded as they started to create their empire and conquered parts of China as well. And these various uh, foreign rules had different uh, impacts on Buddhism. Buddhism basically survived in all the countries despite the colonialism, um, but there were disruptions and changes and also influence from getting ideas from European culture. For example, the Christian Protestant missionaries uh, in Sri Lanka during the period of British rule had an impact on the evolution of Theravada Buddhism there. So a bit more about the history of Buddhism during the 19th century. So first of all, some Westerners started to study Buddhism in India and other uh, nations because even though Buddhism had died out in India, they discovered some of these sites uh, like Bodh Gaya, um, excavated them, restored them, um, translated a uh, Brahmi script, uh, which had been um, unknown to Indians, like how to read it. Um, it was discovered by some European scholars and they started to translate some ancient Buddhist inscriptions and such like in India, but also elsewhere in Asia. In fact, the earliest period of Western scholarship of Buddhism tended to be from just interviewing people. So getting oral sources in the early 1800s, but by the mid to late 1800s, they started to study and translate Buddhist texts by learning Pali, Sanskrit, and other Asian languages. Um, in Sri Lanka, as mentioned, there was an influence from Protestant Christian missionaries who were able to convert some Sri Lankans to Christianity, but most Sri Lankans actually remained Theravada Buddhist. But there was a Buddhist revival movement, an attempt 
to protect Buddhism, make sure that people did not lose their religion, not lose their cultural heritage, and that proved to be quite successful. In fact, the Sri Lankan um, Theravada Buddhist revival was even exported to a certain extent to England itself and to other countries, including other Theravada countries. One interesting aspect of it was the formation of the YMBA, the Young Men's Buddhist Association, which was formed by some Europeans, actually, some theosophists, um, obviously on the model of the Young Men's Christian Association. The significance there is that it was an association for lay people, uh, for them to have some contact and education in the religion, and to organize the youth to get them involved in the religion. There was also some influence from Protestant Christianity, which has the idea that every Christian should study the scripture themselves. So that became an idea in um, Theravada Buddhism as well, that um, lay people, not just monks, should study the Pali Canon, for example, and uh, even do things like practice meditation, which traditionally was not commonly done um, that often by lay people or even by monks uh, at that point in Sri Lankan Buddhism. So a key figure in this Buddhist revival was Anagarika Dharmapala. He wrote a bunch of books, so he really helped inspire uh, Sri Lankans, and he also journeyed to the West to help spread Theravada Buddhism. There were some people in England who converted to Theravada Buddhism of the Sri Lankan variety. The Theosophists were um, a new religious movement developed by some Europeans in the 1800s, and they really mixed and matched a bunch of different religions and mystical and magical belief systems into a new amalgamation. From their perspective, they were taking these eternal truths that had been taught by a lot of different traditions and finding the kind of consistent, coherent whole behind them. But they also added a lot of uh, teachings of their own. But even though um, the Theosophists did not only consider themselves Buddhists, they liked Buddhism, they wanted to promote it and preserve it. So some of them were actually participating in the Buddhist revival in Sri Lanka, such as their assistance in founding the Young Men's Buddhist Association. So I mentioned the fact that meditation practice had declined even among many monks in Sri Lanka. This had happened for some reason in uh, all of the Theravada countries, including Burma, Thailand, and others. But there was a huge revival of meditation practice in the late 1800s, uh, and it seemed to happen simultaneously in different places. So in the late 1800s, there were meditation masters that emerged in Burma, Sri Lanka, and Thailand separately, and founded these new lineages of meditation teaching that really continue until this day. And one of the new things about them was they would often have lay people as students, not only monks. As far as I'm aware, meditation, even though it's not emphasized equally by all Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhists, there were still some um, sects of Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhism that kept up a really robust meditation practice up until modern times. But the Theravadins themselves by now have a very strong meditation tradition too. Um, and finally, there were some adaptations of Buddhism to the modern age by Buddhists in Asia, including, for example, in China, there was a monk named Tai Shu who developed Renjian Fojiao, or humanistic Buddhism. So this was an attempt to make Buddhism more relevant to modern society, modern politics, modern life. By that point, Chinese Buddhism had evolved so that it mainly focused on the afterlife and securing a good next life for yourself and your ancestors. But Tai Shu wanted to emphasize the fact that the Buddhist Dharma could be used to reform society, make it more just, improve education, and all this sort of thing. There was also a long period of persecution of Buddhism throughout Asia. The European colonialist period did put some pressures on it, but nowhere near what you saw during the uh, communist regimes and the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia during the 20th century. So communism spread throughout large parts of East and Southeast Asia in the 20th century, and um, communism is an atheist ideology, so it's officially opposed to all religions, and 
every communist regime is different and different periods of the same regime are different in terms of how they treat religion. So some communist regimes give de facto a lot of religious freedom, uh, you know, at least relatively speaking. But at many times they have tried to wipe out religion because they see it as an enemy ideology. That was how Karl Marx uh, saw it to a large extent, that religion was a kind of delusion created by the ruling class, the capitalists, to keep the proletariat, the working class, exploited. So there was a lot of direct attacks on Buddhism and other religions in Asia by these communist regimes. The People's Republic of China is a communist regime that was founded in 1949 in mainland China, established by the Chinese uh, Communist Party, the CCP. Um, and they persecuted Buddhism, especially during the Cultural Revolution, which the founder and leader of the Communist Party, Mao Zedong, initiated. It lasted from around 1966 to 1976. This was when Mao and his followers were trying to completely reinvent society to get rid of everything old, i.e. everything pre-communist or non-communist, and that included religions like Buddhism and Taoism. So a lot of temples were destroyed, a lot of um, icons and scriptures were destroyed, um, monks were forcibly defrocked, um, so it was a huge blow to Chinese Buddhism. Previously in the 1950s, Tibet, which had been a part of the Chinese empire for centuries, but had been largely autonomous, in other words, left to govern its own affairs as long as it paid tribute to the emperor or to the president of China. But that ended in 1950 after the communists took over. So they uh, destroyed a lot of the monasteries and libraries in Tibet. They killed and tortured some of the Tibetan Buddhist monks. And so eventually in 1959, the Dalai Lama, who was the traditional governor of Tibet and um, one of the senior Buddhist clergymen there fled with a lot of his uh, fellow clergymen and some other um, former government officials. They fled to India in 1959 and established a government in exile. And after that, Tibetan Buddhism was to a large extent controlled or suppressed in China. It still exists, but it started to spread outside of China because of that diaspora under the Dalai Lama. Um, and another example is uh, Cambodia. Um, they got their independence from French colonial rule in 1953, but a couple of decades later, there was a bizarre regime called the Khmer Rouge that took over. And the Khmer Rouge was apparently uh, initially somewhat influenced by communism. Um, there was also a communist revolution in Vietnam that was happening around the same time that uh, had also put a lot of pressure on Buddhism, but the Khmer Rouge under its founder or leader Pol Pot developed a very strange, secular, but extremely nationalist ideology. Pol Pot basically wanted to restore what he thought of as this ideal, ancient, and purely Cambodian period of history um, to Cambodia, and he tried to destroy everything inconsistent with his vision, which included Buddhism. So almost all the Buddhist temples and libraries were destroyed, Many monks were murdered or forced to work for the government. Um, in 1979, this nightmare ended, but after a lot of massacres, including a Buddhist, the picture shows uh, skulls from some of the mass graves that were created under the Khmer Rouge regime. Even though Buddhism uh, institutionally was almost completely destroyed, a lot of the people in Cambodia, most of them still identify as Theravada Buddhist. So there was a revival of it, including the reopening of the Buddhist Institute in the capital in 1992, which had a large uh, Buddhist library. The library was destroyed, but it was uh, recreated around the time of the reopening. So Buddhism has started to revive in Cambodia, also in neighboring uh, places like uh, in Southeast Asia, like Vietnam, despite the fact that there were long periods of persecution. During the 18 and 1900s, Buddhism also began spreading to the West. So Anagarika Dharmapala, the important Sri Lankan uh, Buddhist figure, he visited Britain three times in 1893, 1896, and 1907. He taught people there about Theravada Buddhism, and there were some uh, British people uh, who converted. Uh, and Theravada Buddhism in the late 18 early 1900s was the most common kind 
to be uh, believed in by Europeans. There were also some Germans who traveled to Sri Lanka that became monks. Um, but a prominent uh, British convert was Alan Bennett, who became a Theravada monk. He was known as Ananda Mateya. Uh, he also helped found the Buddhist Society of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which was also uh, partially founded in inspiration from the visits of Anagarika Dharnapala. And it's interesting because even though Alan Bennett became a uh, basically an orthodox Theravada Buddhist, he was initially influenced by theosophy, which is not a form of Buddhism. It takes some Buddhist ideas, but kind of mishes and mashes them up with Hindu um, and the esoteric beliefs of various kinds. Um, but he was also influenced by a poem called The Light of Asia about the Buddha by Edwin Arnold. And this was a kind of a romantic or idealist or orientalist poem from the late 1800s in England, but it did have a big influence in promoting Buddhism, showing the Buddha as this enlightened figure who would have a message, a dharma, a message of salvation that was kind of more appropriate or fitting for a modern age. A lot of Europeans and Westerners of that time, as well as even today, look upon Buddhism as something that is more enlightened perhaps in Christianity, something that is more compatible with modern science, something that is more of a moral philosophy or a spirituality that could be less supernatural, doesn't demand belief in resurrection, for example. At least that's the way it's often pitched. And so I think Edwin Arnold's poem is a very important moment in that spread of that version of Buddhism uh, to the West. So theosophy, I already mentioned, including the foundation of the Young Men's Buddhist Association in Sri Lanka, specifically um, an Englishman named Christmas Humphreys, who was a theosophist, was influential in the spread of Buddhism because there were a lot of um, theosophical uh, organizations and branches that were kind of aligned with Buddhism. So uh, he combined a Theosophical Buddhist center with the Buddhist Society of Great Britain, Northern Ireland to form the Buddhist Lodge in 1924. Later on, this was just renamed the Buddhist Society uh, in London in 1943, and now it's simply called the Buddhist Society, not with London. Um, so this was the first wave of the spread of Buddhism to the West, Theravada. In the early to mid 1900s, Zen Buddhism became more popular and spread to the West as well, really starting in the 1920s and 30s. One of the main figures in this was D.T. Suzuki. He was a Japanese Zen Buddhist practitioner and also a scholar of Zen Buddhism who taught Buddhist philosophy at Otani University in Tokyo, but he was fluent in English. He wrote English language books, articles, and essays on Zen Buddhism that were published both before and after the Second World War, especially after the Second World War ended uh, U.S. and Japan were no longer at war. There were several Americans and others who traveled to Japan to study under Japanese Zen masters. Some of those Japanese Zen masters also traveled to the West and opened up Zen centers of things in that nature. So there was a big wave of interest in Zen Buddhism. It's still around, but it started in the 1930s a bit, and then especially during the 1950s after World War II and continued into the 60s. And then the third main wave of the spread of Buddhism to the West happened after 1959, when the Dalai Lama fled Tibet, along with a lot of the other senior Tibetan Buddhist clergy. And many of them traveled to the West, like Great Britain, Canada, the United States, other countries. Um, so in the 1960s and 70s, Tibetan Buddhism started to be taught um, and started to take root, especially becoming popular in the 1970s and 1980s. So one of the key figures in this was Chogyam Trungpa. He, along with Dr. Akong Tolku Rinpoche, founded the Kagyu Samye Ling Monastery in Scotland in 1967, but also Chogyam Trungpa uh, founded the Naropa Institute, now the Naropa University in Colorado in 1974. And so there were many Western converts to the Tibetan form of Vajrayana Buddhism, including some who became monks and nuns. And by now, all of the major Asian schools and sects of Buddhism are present in the West, as well as some versions of Buddhism that were developed in the West specifically. So um, one of the 
uh, things that confronts all modern Buddhists is how to apply Buddhist ethical principles to modern society, but also to contemporary issues, especially conflicts, especially war and other violent conflicts. So Buddhism is basically anti-war, anti-violence, but there have been occasions, and there still are, where Buddhists may support um, a certain war or a certain um, government that is engaging in military actions, perhaps because they believe that it um, is protecting or supporting Buddhism, perhaps just because they believe um, it is justified um, despite the usual um, Buddhist call for nonviolence. So an example of this is that the Japanese military government during World War II was actually supported by a lot of uh, most of the Buddhist uh, clergy and sects, despite the fact that a lot of the Japanese actions, both in the war and in their colonial administrations, like for example in China, where there were some uh, war crimes, some massacres, some other forms of brutalization that are too disturbing even to talk about. Um, some of those were, you know, being done by the government. And so this is the sort of thing that according to normal Buddhist ethics should probably be opposed. But a lot of the Buddhists were just, you know, drawn into the culture of nationalism, of patriotism. It would have been regarded as a betrayal if they weren't supporting their government. Nevertheless, there were a few Buddhist peace activists in Japan during this period, but they were imprisoned and persecuted by the government, as you might expect. Um, in Cambodia, there was the Coalition for Peace and Reconciliation, which was established after the fall of the Khmer Rouge and was led by a Buddhist monk, Maha Gosananda, shown here in the picture. And he survived the Khmer Rouge mainly because he was outside of the country in Thailand in 1975 when that murderous regime took over. So after the regime fell, he came back and he tried to promote reconciliation of both the victims and the victimizers of that regime on Buddhist principles of compassion, nonviolence, and the like. Through the 1990s, there were a series of Dhamma Yetras, or Pilgrimages for Truth, in Cambodia, which were walks by monks and lay people for the sake of peace, trying to advocate peace in parts of the country that were still being torn by conflict. Um, in Sri Lanka, on the other hand, a lot of the Buddhist monks and lay people supported the government's war against a um, ethnic separatist group. The Tamil Tigers were the uh, rebel group or um, considered by some a terrorist group uh, because of their actions against some both uh, military and civilian targets over the years that was trying to fight for independence for the Hindu Tamil speaking minority within the nation of Sri Lanka. The majority of Sri Lankans are Buddhists and most of them uh, speak Sinhala, uh, which is a different language. It's a language derived from Sanskrit, unlike Tamil, which is a Dravidian language. But the government eventually defeated the Tamil separatists. But regardless of that, um, the monks and Buddhist lay people who supported the government's war, some people criticized them as not following Buddhist principles, again, of nonviolence or non-aggression. Um, and then in Myanmar, the nation formerly known as Burma, the government there was a military dictatorship for many decades. They kind of restored a parliamentary democracy, but the military elite still controls uh, most things behind the scenes. There's been a kind of mixed relation between them and the Buddhist clergy. For the most part, the Buddhist clergy did not oppose the regime and got some support from it for many decades. But there was a period in the 2000s where the Buddhist clergy started to protest against the government and joined some of the pro-democracy protests. There was a crackdown. Um, there were some Buddhist clergy who disappeared. They might have been killed by the government. I don't know. I'm not sure they were ever accounted for. Um, there was enough pressure put on the government to open things up to have a parliamentary democracy system restored. That was restored, um, but it has since been somewhat curtailed. In addition, there was a war um, by the government against a Muslim minority called the Rohingyas. And a lot of the Buddhists in Myanmar, both monks and lay people, have supported that war. Again, you can see the tension between um, fighting to preserve or protect what they regard as a Buddhist nation or a Buddhist identity with the Buddhist principle of nonviolence. And that tension has come up again and again in a lot of these uh, cultures and regimes in the 20th and 21st centuries. 
Uh, women have played a role in Buddhism almost since the beginning. When the Buddha became enlightened, he initially only taught that men could become renunciates or ascetics and become monks. But within a few years, he had several um, very influential and senior uh, female followers, including his own stepmother, Mahapajapati. And according to the story, Mahapajapati approached the Buddha with five uh, in a group of five women who all wanted to become ascetics and kept on asking him, isn't it true that women have the same potential to become enlightened just like men? And at first the Buddha was reluctant. He didn't want to ordain them, but eventually he admitted, yes, women can become enlightened. So it makes sense to allow them to become nuns. And he ordained them as the first bhikkhunis or bhikshunis in Sanskrit. That's the word for nun. Uh, there's also the word teri, which means an elder uh, nun. And the nuns uh, composed even some parts of the Pali canon, such as the teri gatha. Those are the poems uh, or the gattas of the teris. Um, however, even though they've been there since the beginning and nuns do exist in many Buddhist countries, the lineage of nuns died out um, in some Buddhist countries, particularly the Theravada ones. And in some Buddhist countries today, like in Thailand, for example, it's considered very controversial to claim to be or to want to be or to allow or to advocate women to become nuns. Um, there's kind of a technical reason for this. In the uh, Vinaya, the code of conduct for monks and nuns, Technically, in order to have a full ordination to become um, a complete nun, so that's the higher ordination, it's the same concept, you have to have, I think it's uh, five senior um, nuns who are doing the ordination ceremony. Well, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. If there are no currently higher ordained nuns, you can't have the ceremony be valid to have a new nun. So in Thailand, it's considered very controversial to advocate or to allow um, women to become fully ordained. Even in Thailand, though, there are some women who take vows as if they were nuns, and even though they don't have the ordination ceremony, they still function in their spiritual life as nuns, and sometimes they may teach the Dharma and things like that as well. Um, but there are other uh, ordination lineages of nuns that have survived, like in China, for example, and in Tibet. Um, even though the full ordination didn't survive in Tibet, but there were uh, orders of nuns, nevertheless, who practiced the Dharma. Um, and so uh, that has led to this modern organization called the Sakya Dita, which means Daughters of the Buddha, which was founded in 1987. And this was originally just found to have like an interfaith conference of Buddhist women from many different countries. But it led to contact between women in Theravada countries who wanted to fully ordain as nuns, but who couldn't because there was no valid um, full ordination lineage in their country. And so what happened was there have been some ceremonies where fully ordained Mahayana nuns, for example, from East Asian countries, uh, together with some senior Theravada monks, have presided over full ordination ceremonies for some women from Theravada countries. Now, some people claim that these are still not valid, but this has basically allowed a lot of women in Theravada countries to become fully ordained. So the basic uh, picture is that women have truly always been somewhat marginalized within Buddhism. Uh, patriarchal attitudes have been common there throughout its history, just like in other religions. Um, there's some Buddhist texts, for example, that say or imply that women are inherently less pure than men. But on the other hand, from the beginning, the Buddha has also taught that yes, women be can become enlightened. And there are a lot of female Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and Arhants that are worshiped and revered by all kinds of Buddhists and have been um, since the beginning. Uh, engaged Buddhism is a modern type of Buddhism that's evolved in the last couple of decades. It's not a sect, it's just a cultural movement that some Buddhists of various sects adhere to. It's trying to apply Buddhist ethical principles to modern issues, especially social justice issues like poverty, exploitation, war, oppression, and discrimination. They don't typically um, say that politics is more important than 
um, practices like meditation, but rather they try to leverage or harness meditation um, for the goal of political and social justice. So as far as I know, the term engaged Buddhism comes from this particular organization, the International Network of Engaged Buddhists, which was founded in 1989 by Sulak Sivaraksa, a lay Buddhist from Thailand, and Thich Nhat Hanh, a um, monk from Vietnam. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh fled Vietnam around the time of the Vietnam War, lived in France for most of his life, and taught Buddhism to a largely Western audience. But he was also very involved in political activism and social justice issues. Um, another example of an engaged Buddhist organization is the Amida Trust, which is a British organization drawing inspiration from Pure Land Buddhism, Amida being the Japanese name for the Buddha of the Pure Land, Amitabha. But their interpretation is to work towards a pure land here and now in our world in samsara which they claim was the original message of the buddha now i have to note um out of historical um purposes that this doctrine of the amida trust is probably a modern reinterpretation not the original message of the buddha on the one hand it's probably true that the buddha did teach against a lot of the forms of discrimination based on caste and sex that were common in his day. Like, for example, the very fact that he allowed women to become nuns would have been scandalous for a lot of ancient Indians. And also, he taught that Brahmins shouldn't be so privileged, they shouldn't regard themselves as superiors to others, etc. So, by his standards, he, uh, by the standards of his time, rather, he was teaching a kind of very egalitarian um, political or I guess you would say social philosophy or moral philosophy even though he did still have aspects of his teaching that was hierarchical as well but the main point to keep in mind is that traditional forms of Buddhism going back to the Buddha himself have not emphasized so much political reform and trying to make the world a better place they have they have done that to a certain extent so they have said, like with Ashoka the Great, for example, the goal is to have a more just society with less violence, less oppression. Absolutely, that's a goal of traditional Buddhism. But the notion of that we should try to make samsara, the pure land, that is very modern. Because traditionally in Buddhism, samsara is regarded as impure, as fallen, if you will as something that we need to transcend, that we need to move beyond. So there's always been this aspect of Buddhism that is actually very otherworldly. We do what we can to reform or make better our conditioned existence, but we realize it's ultimately impermanent, suffering, not self. So we don't want to be so attached to it. We don't want to cling to it. We don't want to think that we can make heaven or nirvana or even the pure land here on earth, so to speak. Rather, the ultimate goal is to just transcend it. So it's interesting to see that message kind of transformed or twisted or tweaked in modern times. And partly it's because of the influence of, uh, you know, Western political ideologies and that sort of thing. Um, and then finally, a bit about the interfaith relations between Buddhism and other religions, but also the intercultural relations with Buddhism uh, from Asia and the West. So if you look back in history, in the 1800s, during the period of the peak of European colonialism, there was some tension and mistrust between Buddhists and Christians, for example. Um, it really varied from colony to colony, but in some of those European colonies in Asia, they were definitely trying to promote um, different types of Christianity, whether Protestant or Catholic, and convert people. Uh, so in Sri Lanka, this led to a reaction against the presence of those Christian missionaries. But today, um, a lot of Buddhists participate in interfaith conferences and movements with Christians and members of other religions too. So one example of that is the modern um, Japanese Buddhist sect or organization rather, uh, Risho Kosei Kai, which was founded in 1938 by lay people. And it's one of the founders of the World Conference on Religion and Peace that was created in 1970. Another example is the Society for Buddhist Christian Studies, founded in 1987 in the United States. Another example, the European Network of Buddhist Christian Studies, founded in 1997. So there have been a lot of these uh, interfaith movements and organizations trying to create cooperation between religions. On the cultural side, as we've kind of seen through several examples, Buddhism has changed 
due to mutual influence between both Asian and Western cultures. So another example of that, apart from engaged Buddhism specifically, is the larger trend of what's called Buddhist modernism. You could look at engaged Buddhism as one more contemporary facet or subset of Buddhist modernism. And Buddhist modernism is a recent term. I don't. I think it's only a few decades old. I think it was first developed by some scholars like Donald Lopez, but um, it, what it refers to goes back to the 1800s. And partly it's a matter of Westerners interpreting Buddhism through the lens of Western culture and expectation. So for example, it was very common for Western converts in the 18 and 1900s, and still today, to claim that Buddhism is a scientific religion, that Buddha didn't teach anything supernatural. He taught a philosophy of how to end suffering and transform our minds. Um, this is not really true. Like He believed in you know, miraculous powers and gods and demonic beings and spirits and all this kind of stuff. But this is their take, their way of emphasizing certain aspects of Buddhism. Um, and they also would try to adapt Buddhist moral principles to Western moral and political ideas like their support for liberalism and democracy, for example. But this wasn't only a Western thing. This was also happening in um, Asian countries among Asian Buddhists themselves. So for example, in the Buddhist revival in Sri Lanka, that was one of the other epicenters of Buddhist modernism, where they themselves were trying to adapt their traditional Theravada Buddhism to modern science, to um, modern technology, to modern society, to um, some of these Western political ideas that they were getting. So while Pola Rahula, for example, was a famous Sri Lankan Buddhist who wrote a book called What the Buddha Taught, which was very influential in getting a lot of Western converts to Buddhism, but also expressed his own Buddhist modernist take on the traditional Theravadan Buddhism of Sri Lanka. And you can go through other examples too, like the monk uh, Tai Shu from China, who on his own developed a humanistic Buddhism in the early 1900s. Well, that's it for our summary of Buddhism. I do hope that was helpful. Next up is going to be part five on Chinese, Korean, and Japanese religions, although we're going to separate it into different parts for each of those main nations. Until next time.